outlook notifications um hi everyone uh thank you appreciate the time um oh shoot the thing's covering my notes sorry yeah uh good morning uh welcome to aws Midwest, uh, community days and thank you margaret for organizing all this and the the various uh uh, AWS community leaders here today. Uh, and thanks for morning start hosting all this. So uh, just to get into it. So using machine learning to solve life's problems uh, kind of sounds like a, a loaded question or a loaded statement, but hopefully we, we break that down for you and able to define use cases similar to this in your own lives where you can use machine learning and AWS to, to solve your problems. Uh, as well as I'd love us to be interactive at some point, you know, I, I want you to hopefully, you know, raise some questions. So um, after the fact, we'll, we'll have a mic or you can yell uh, first question. So I'll definitely save some time. So um, think about anything, you have any questions about the uh, presentation. Sorry. There we go. Um, so before we get started, I'll spend a few minutes just introducing myself. So I'm Ross Stewart. Uh, I am a senior solution architect at AHEAD, which is a professional services consulting company located right here in Chicago, uh, not far from where we sit. Um, my, my role is really building data platforms uh, and uh, enabling companies to, to leverage machine learning analytics to solve their business needs. Um, my background is actually in computer networking, uh, based in like, you know, old school data centers, uh, but quickly moved, made the move into like Hadoop and big data um, and really understanding how to, to best leverage those, uh, the data that every organization has um, using like Spark, Hive and things like that. Um, as well as I once proudly held um, 12 AWS certifications that were all active. That was all of them at the time. Um, and last but not least, uh, that's at least a preview to this talk is I love to ride bicycles. Um, okay. So now just to set the, the stage, uh, back in 2020, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, back in 2020, um, trying to get to work, uh, living here in Chicago. I know work close to here. Uh, I live uh, not too far, like four miles from here. Um, you can take the train. Back then, especially, uh, trains were running slow. They had a shortage of conductors, uh, and I want to get to work. Um, it took about 45 minutes, just given it was not close to the station. You know, in the city, there's, there's probably several options you could walk, I guess. Um, but I love to ride bicycles, and I can cut the commute uh, in more than half at that time uh, by, by biking. There's a bike lane. You get to view the city, get some sunrises over the, the downtown as you get in, come in. Uh, it works great. Uh, the only fact is, you know, it, sometimes the year gets hot. And actually, in fact, 2020 was the hottest year on record for Chicago, uh, dating back to when the records began in 1871, which is actually the year of the Chicago fire, uh, presumably destroyed records before that. Uh, but um, did he have a solution? So hopefully you saw as you came in, there's actually a Divi location right next to this building, which is how I got here today. Um, they started rolling out e-bikes in uh, July of 2020. Um, you know, they, they e-assist, you don't get tired or, uh, you know, get, um, have to work very hard to get in. So it was a, a perfect solution for getting to work. I could, you know, slowly get ready. I could look at the app when I get up in the morning, see if there's e-bikes available, set my time, shower and get ready for work, um, which worked great. Um, you know, if, if, uh, it got too hot, I could, you know, not be too tired. And one summer's day in, in August, 2020, so shortly after they um, rolled out the e-bikes. Uh, I checked in the morning, there's three e-bikes available. I had a presentation that morning, um, hop in the shower, 45 minutes later, takes a long time to shower, uh, not because of the hair, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, I walked to the debut station and lo and behold, there's none there, uh, which is problematic <laughs> if I have a meeting. Um, so I it only took the only option. I didn't have time to hop on the train. Took a normal e-bike, very heavy and slow. Uh, got to work and arrived sweaty. Uh, that's what's coined as now, not because of me. I don't know. Um, but attended my meeting. Uh, you know, went on with my day. It's just not a good look for me. But in that meeting, I had a little aha moment. Like, there's got to be a better way. You know, I'm building machine learning algorithms. 
for my clients every day. I'm learning to, to um, store their data in data lakes and warehouses uh, and leverage machine learning tools to, to predict, you know, all kinds of hard business problems. On e-bike, it's gotta be a pretty easy thing to figure out. So I started to look and say like, you know, what do I need to build a machine learning algorithm? I need historic data. You know, where can I get that? I need to, a platform to host some of these, these tools. So I started to look around. I know Chicago is pretty good about open data. And I found they actually do post the, the Divi data of where um, all the bikes are at all times. It's, it's hard to read. You don't need to really figure out what it is, but um, it, there's an API available with uh, a JSON document where all the bikes are. And even I checked back yesterday and they added all the scooters that are at stations as well. So I think there's a future enhancement coming to, to this uh, application, but um, it's a nested structure of, you know, how many bikes are available, how many e-bikes are available, how many docks are open uh, and a few other things. So I figured out, you know, how can I store this uh, effectively so I can write a machine learning algorithm? Phase one, uh, and this is dating back to almost three years now. Um, but you know, I leverage, you know, we work in the cloud every day. Hopefully we have, you know, have tools available to us. Maybe even we can have an account paid for by work. Um, and this, so I, I, I use the tools I often use. So I, I used uh, AWS SAM, which is a, the serverless uh, application module to, to write the application very effectively and test locally and deploy up. Uh, I created a Lambda function. Uh, I think back then I was using Stack Overflow, um, but I think you could just, you know, use ChatGPT nowadays to, to write some code to, to query the API and store it in S3. Um, you know, I'm storing it in a, a time-stamped uh, file format and pulling from their, their API there. Messy code, but, um, and originally I was also pulling from the Dark Sky API, which is a weather data, uh, thinking, you know, maybe weather would be a big contributor to whether bikes will be available in the future. Interestingly enough, uh, it wasn't. Um, and it was a lot of work and a lot of very expensive joins uh, and a lot of data. Um, you know, looking forward, um, and after joining them, you know, across like non-equal timestamps, um, if the the algorithm found that uh, previous volatility, so whether bikes go from one available to four available to one to three to zero, uh, was a better indicator of future volatility um, than than weather, which was a surprise to me as well as uh, the weather API was deprecated um, after Apple bought them. <laughs> um, and so for here, you know, I'm storing all the data in an S3 bucket, just in JSON format. Um, it's not partitioned in any way besides the, the timestamp. Um, and I'm using event bridge, which you know, all is coded into with Sam for scheduling to run every minute. So I can do that, that historical time series um, and most time series algorithms to give you the full um, availability of, of the, the options, uh, every minute is how often they work. So every five or 15 wasn't really uh, as good an option. As of today, there is over 650,000 files in an S3 bucket, uh, and it's totaling about 300 uh, gigabytes of storage. It's not terrible uh, given the cost. So. So step two, you know, I need to, to find value in this. It's next, nested data. Uh, it's the JSON document. Most algorithms don't accept documents a, as input. So I need to figure out how to parse this data and, and find value. So you know, I want to predict per station for bikes. I don't want to hear the whole Chicago per se. Um, so I figure I have to unnest the data and really um, parse it out. So um, I could use Athena. I initially use Athena, which is their, their serverless um, SQL uh, service, you know, built on like Presto for on S3, but I wanted to, to get a little more performance. And I mean, to be honest, I just wanted to test out Snowflake, which is a, you know, a serverless uh, cloud data warehouse. It's also built on AWS as well under the hood. So, you know, I ingest the data in, you can have S3 as a source um, and, and just load it in as each document is its own um, record in the database as just the, the raw data to keep that, that raw data in place. And I'm able to, to really do some, you know, light ETL or, or um, cleaning to, to parse it out and, and to break apart all the documents um, and, and really put each row as its own, every station is its own row. Um, as well as, you know, it has epoch as time. So put it in a standard timestamp in, you know, central time, um, unnesting and pivoting the tables so that it's not just like a multiple nested structures. So it doesn't work well for, for tables or, or machine learning algorithms. Um, as well as I set up an auto ingest. So there's ability to, when S3 lands, you can set up events out of the bucket um, and it goes into a queue and Snowflake auto ingests it. And I have a job to put from the staging table into like the fact table. 
that's great. So I, I have all the historical data. That's like, you know, step one of, of machine learning algorithms. Uh, next, I have to figure out how can I, I find value in this data? You know, my goal is so I can wake up and know if I have to like get to work quickly and shower there, or if I can slowly get ready, have breakfast, then go in. Uh, you know, I'm not a data scientist. You know, I, I know how to like do some data engineering, but I need a tool. Um, you know, your obvious answer might be SageMaker, given we're at an AWS conference. Um, at the time, they didn't support uh, time series forecasting. I looked at another tool, and, and gratefully, uh, Ahead is a, a partner of Data Robot, and I have free account. So that is a, you know, a stipulation in this scenario. Um, but, you know, they, they offer time series forecasting as well as some out of the box. And, you know, they're also a SaaS platform. So everything in this table uh, is, you know, is serverless, you know, essentially. I mean, there's, there's virtual warehouses underneath the hood of Snowflake that's doing the jobs, but they, they auto um, um, sleep and auto resume automatically. And it's running on a very small cluster. And thankfully nothing's built to me. Um, but uh, for data robot, I'm able to get, you know, set up a JDBC query into the fact table. Uh, and I essentially just tell it what I want to predict. So the future, the uh, the featured target or target variable, is um, I create a boolean function within Snowflake, and it's oops, uh, a boolean function within Snowflake as like the target variable. It's a it's a boolean function of are there more than one e-bikes available? I don't really care if there's four or two or one. I just want one available. Um, and so I set that in Snowflake as like the target variable. So I point that uh, data robot at the table, and say that's the target. Um, you have all this historical data. Um, but tell me over the next 10 hours, what's available. So essentially pump in the source table, source query is like looking at the last 10 hours. And I say, tell me the next 10 hours. Um, and it does all the feature engineering. Like, is it weekday? Is it weekend? It doesn't have weather data. All it has is the historical. It does look backs of 30 minutes, 60 minutes, two hours to see what's the volatility of each station. Sorry. Um, and then it, it, you know, it, it creates the prediction file and writes that back to, to, to Snowflake. Um, from there, I'm able to, initially it was Streamlit, uh, which is a company that Snowflake acquired um, maybe a year or two ago. And it's a Python driven um, SaaS offering for building web pages um, for data applications. It's very um, designed for creating connections to databases and visualizing data. And it's free, it you know, connects in with your, your GitHub, et cetera. Uh, later on, just to get a little better UI, we, we um, changed it to Power BI. But again, you know, we're not running any servers. Uh, and it kind of someone offered help for, for one piece and created a, a nicer UI than I created. Um, it's crazy, but as of today, there is over 600 million lines in that fact table alone. Um, and in this job continues to run um, even today. Here is the, the future iteration of sweatyross.com. And uh, yes, my employer does own that URL. Um, it's, uh, this, is the, this is the currently the next version coming out soon. I don't know when I get approval to publish it, but uh, the, the Streamlit app is still up, but you know, it's showing a map of Chicagoland. There's over a thousand stations around Chicago. And the, the dots indicate essentially like what's the probability of there being e-bike in the near future. But then you can click on each one and drill down and, and visualize the data. And this is what's coming out of Snowflake or out of, uh, out of Snowflake, but um, from the data robot predictions of over the next 10 hours, what's the availability like? Is it gonna be you know, 20% in 20 minutes? Is it gonna be 80%? And then over the next several hours. So what are your chances, your best chances of getting an e-bike at that station? So you can select on a few and visualize it. But you'll see here in the next, you know, Short time, it's going to be um, you know very low percentage of chance, probably seventeen, and then in the future, you know, towards the end of the day, you're likely to get a bike. Um, given the stations probably near some apartment buildings, they leave work, they come there, um, but you never know. I was trying to do some machine learning in my head, and I thought, why not use the data to visualize it instead of just second guess. Uh, this is super useful. So now I can, you know, like even when I get, go to the bed at night, I can see like how early I have to get up. Can I sleep in if I'm out late? Um, and how do I get to, you know, work quickly versus having to, to ride a standard bike, which are very heavy and slow, I, I promise, uh, especially in, you know, 70 or 90 degree days in Chicago. Um, so that was, you know, that's, that was the app. It, it's still up to date. Um, uh, one piece I, I'll touch on here is things change often. I checked the web page this morning and it was down, just demo gods never ever help out. Um, but it was working yesterday, but you know, um, some of the key takeaways is, you know, we can all do this. This is not like I didn't have to use any machine or algorithms myself. I really let data robot do that. It, it creates a, it tests all kinds of algorithms like, you know, K nearest neighbor, um, extreme gradient boost, all these different things. I don't know what they do. 
it just tells me how to predict what I want to predict. Um, you know, building simple lambdas that you could essentially ask ChatGPT to create for you. Um, you know, it, it costs me nothing to be fair. Um, but overall, I mean, number of uh, every single minute lambda and functions going to cost the under the free tier, um, as well as probably the the, the S three storage. Uh, and I think we all have some of the skills. You know, we're in this room because we enjoy AWS, um, and I think these are all very attainable things. Uh, next is there's use cases like this all over. I mean, there's e-bikes available in most major cities. I know walking around New York City, I'm like wondering what's the chance I can get a city bike here tonight after we go to the bar. Um, but you know, everyone probably has a Nest thermostat. You can you know do um, harvest that data and see what your usages are. Uh, even uh, your garage door opener. We have data being produced everywhere, um, and this is just a single example of what you can do uh, just you know with simple tools. Things change often. Yeah, the, the website broke today. I don't know why. I think they upgraded some packages. Um, but as soon as I built the initial algorithm, they changed the station ID because there's over a thousand now. They were a three digit integer. Doesn't work very well when you get to four. Um, so they, they made it like a 16 digit hexadecimal uh, character. So I had to rewrite the algorithm to point a different variable. Um, API has become deprecated. Uh, Dark Sky API um, you know, shut down uh, soon after I created it. Um, they have the e-bikes now, the, the scooters, uh, it is on the, 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 the uh, API as well. So maybe you can always, you know, revert to scooter if you don't want to um, take an e-bike. Um, but yeah, things are always changing. You never know. So it's always, you know, keeping up with, with um, technology changes. And have fun. This is totally cool. No one asked me to, to build a data warehouse with 10 million rows and to present a conference about e-bikes in Chicago and getting to work on time. Uh, but it's just fun. You know, I think we all can, can learn. It's great to be able to do all this yourselves. Sometimes we get very pigeonholed in a certain area we work in at work. This gives you the ability to, to build it from the ground up uh, and really learn so much more and have a lot of fun at the same time. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to leave you with a few other things, but. Uh, a uh, few pictures from from taking bikes uh, around the country and world, um, you know, testing out ones in, in Madrid or Barcelona and, uh, you know, hiking, doing through a biking through Alaska uh, is life's like riding a bicycle, keep your balance and you must keep moving. Um, I think there's a lot of similarities to us at work, uh, continuous innovation, you know, we're constantly striving to, to keep a pace of technology changes, keep up with the industry trends, you know, there's over 300 services in AWS. You know, how can you possibly keep up with every feature release? Agility and adaptability, um, you know, knowing when to, to change your, your model, change um, your service and re-architect, um, but always keeping up to date. Uh, embracing change, you know, I think uh, a lot of people didn't like want to move to the cloud long ago. Um, and so trying to, to keep pushing, keep striving, keep innovating is a constant piece. Um, you're constantly changing when you're riding uh, various terrains um, and, and routes. Uh, perseverance, um, you know, learning can be hard. Learning to ride a bike can be hard. Um, I think it's very similar to, you know, trying to, to do a cloud migration, for instance, or even just uh, set up your first project in, within AWS at the cloud is, you know, you're bound to have shortcomings and shortfalls, but just keep pushing and striving to get it done and get that first iteration out the door so you can start iterating on top of that. And then balance. Uh, I think there's a lot of balance in bicycles, hopefully, um, but having balance within your cloud environment of, let's say, speed, security, agility, customer needs is a lot of similarities. And, and that's all I had. Um, the code, all the code I used is in GitHub right there. You know, feel free to fork it, clone it. You know, PRs are welcome. Uh, I can't be on Instagram or out on Instagram, uh, uh, LinkedIn, uh, it's right there. And uh, are there any questions? We have a microphone, but I think I can hear y'all. Yeah, go for it. That's a good question. Um, yeah, uh, the question is, if I had to re-architect it today, what would I change? Um, I would keep a lot of it the same, I think. You know, I think the Lambda function to, to save it is a great way. Um, I think for the most, I, I think I'd architect the, I have a scheduled job in Snowflake to take out of the raw into the, the fact table. I think they can do a stream now, so I wouldn't have to you know, do it every 15 minutes. Um, I might uh, make the web page. I'd start with Power BI instead of Streamlit. 
But I, I think there's some work to be done on like, yeah, just the ingestion of the fact table and in some enriching processes, uh, as well as Stereo, I did have some shortcomings of just scale. I initially did it with um, eight stations, like the stations I cared about, like a few next to my house and a few next to work. Uh, when I tried to scale that out to every single station, it kind of choked on me. I had like a 10 gig uh, ingest or, you know, like source um, limit. Um, and so I think I'd have to like to, to break that out into every neighborhood. There's like, a, you know, 97 or 96 neighborhoods. So building a new algorithm per neighborhood would be a big change that would make it more accurate. Great question. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. So question is, did I ride a Divi here today? And did I consult the model? So uh, yes, I rode Divi here today. And um, well, that website was down. I actually did query the Snowflake database directly. Um, but I also knew I was getting here pretty early and there was a several available, but I wanted to make sure it was running effectively. But yes, I did take one today um, and I didn't get sweaty, hopefully. So it worked out well. <laughs> Anyone else? I think we got time for a few questions. I think I'm ahead of schedule. Yeah. Probability, um, That's a good question. Uh, I, I have the model at 80. That's where it is. Um, yeah, sorry, the question is, what is the, the threshold I use for if I'm going to take an e-bike or you know, wait and go versus just go now and shower work? Um, I think it's, you know, somewhat is depending on if I have like, if I have time to kill, um, I can always just like take a, uh, take a train in. Um, I, my model is set to 80% of what it, it predicts. That's the 80% threshold accuracy is what it uses for the visualizations and the predictions. Um, I would say that's about right. Um, it also just depends. Like if I'm going home, so you, I often like it works just as well going home, especially in the middle of the, you know, late at night, you're like, I, I want to work late and I don't want to take, you know, um, but yeah, I'd say 80% is usually like the threshold I use. Yeah. In a, in a given time hour, cause it might fluctuate throughout the hour. So if I, I can wait, you know, wait or just go there. Uh, but often there is, I mean, there's pretty good density nowadays. You can use several um, as your source and, and combine those. So yeah, go for it. Um, so I did want to, so the question is, uh, I moved from Athena to Snowflake. Uh, what was the rhyme or reason behind that? Um, I, I think performance, not that it mattered too much in my investigations, um, but, you know, Snowflake had like, you know, sub-second response or second response versus Athena was time uh, intensive at times, as well as I kind of wanted to do some pre-processing and you know, put it into a table. And essentially I'm just pre-processing and landing it and still doing the same process of just like, um, you know, reading a bunch of data. Uh, I didn't really spend the time to partition it. I kind of wanted to just work um, as well as uh, I think we were coming up on like a snowflake summit. And I want to test it out, um, but it did provide more performance. Um, I did have, it was still a work account. So I didn't have to pay for it. Um, it's a big, big, uh, big reason why you might do something or not. Um, but yeah, a lot better performance, you know, still had the infinite scalability, like, you know, Athena would or, or snowflake. I didn't really want to run a redshift cluster at the time. And so I just wanted to take, adjust it into to Snowflake uh, as a way to test it out. Yeah. So yeah, performance would be a big one. Mm -hmm. So, um, I thought about like, you know, event data, like, oh, what is like, are Cubs going to make a big difference? Um, you know, I, I didn't really work in that. I know there's ability to like input like special events. Um, but yeah, it was a very expensive query because like they're both epoch times and I had to like, you know, fuzzy join because I had a five minute API access versus like every minute. Um, and that was like, it was literally just costing us money in, in Snowflake. But yeah, in Data Robot, it just gives you like a report of like, what's the biggest indicators. And it was nice because like, I mean, I didn't do any data engineering besides like creating a Boolean function you know, um, of like, is there more than one available? But yeah, it did all the lookbacks. And it says like, you know, the biggest indicator is like availability over 30, 60 and 90 minutes it was the biggest indicator of anything, um, as well as like just other bikes. So you can use like, what's the volatility of non e-bikes versus bikes. So essentially availability had almost everything to do with it. Um, 
versus like, yeah, uh, the weather for this case. But yeah, I thought about using like event data, like, you know, I feel like Cubs games, you know, United or Bulls games or Blackhawks might have a big impact or if there's something else going on, but it seemed to be those like the volatility was a proxy for those. So yeah, go for it. So it only does a 10 hour look back. So the question is, um, I think you guys can hear, but um, uh, if I go to work at the same time every day, which I, I guess I actually don't go to the same time work every day, which is odd, um, uh, does it give me a summary of like, you know, what's the, the probability over every day? It doesn't right now. Um, the, the model essentially just does a 10 hour look back and, and 10 hours in the future. Um, it's certainly, if it looked back, you know, nine, you know, last week, last month, last year, you might get a lot of indicators um, at this time. I don't think DataRobot really supported it in this manner. I'm sure they might know how to use it better than I do um, of how to do those lookbacks, and, and you get more accuracy for sure. Being able to correlate to like what was it last, you know, June fifteenth, and understand what that looked like or, or last month. This is purely looking back. So unfortunately, even like you know, weekend to weekday, it might miss some things. It used that in the model, so it knows it does that feature engineering based on what you learn. So I pumped in 10 gigs of data. I think that only looks back a month maybe. So it doesn't have that data. Question, I think we got time for one more maybe. Anyone else? Yeah, go for it. So great question. So uh, yeah, and a lot of you might not be familiar with Snowflake. So um, Snowflake is a cloud data warehouse. Uh, it runs in, in all the clouds, um, but uh, the similarity in AWS would be Redshift. Um, you know, especially, you know, initially they had it be very tightly coupled from storage to compute. They've since um, created a new storage instance that is very similar to Snowflake being a decoupled, you know, infinitely scalable storage, and then having ability to provision different um, compute volumes on top. So yeah, DynamoDB would be the NoSQL. This would be uh, essentially you could use uh, Redshift, Redshift Spectrum even possibly would be like the similarities to, to Snowflake. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate the time. Uh can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Hey, good morning. Um, how are you all doing? Good, good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was at uh, Reinforce yesterday. I just flew back yesterday night to attend this event. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, what a day to start uh, with uh, the previous keynote where we, are, we talked about solving real life problems with uh, machine learning. Uh, there is just so much happening in machine learning nowadays. Um, you know, applications used to take years to build or build, being built over weekend during weekend hackathons. Uh, generative AI has become a, you know, like a, a buzzword recently. Everybody is talking about generative AI. Uh, here at AWS, we believe generative AI can reinvent every customer applications and uh, interactions. Um, my name is Suresh Pupandi. I'm a senior solutions architect uh, with AWS based in Chicago. I've been with AWS for four years, helping healthcare license customers with their cloud journey. I'm here with my colleague. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Alaki Shuradas, and I'm a senior solutions architect here at AWS. I've been with AWS for about three years, and I support digital native business customers in the US Central. And uh, I've been based in Chicago as well, and uh, very passionate about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, very excited to be here with you all today. Okay, uh, here is the agenda for today. Uh, I'll start with giving a, uh, giving an introduction about generative AI, and then like, you know, what is the foundation model, and then what and why, and then Alec will cover uh, the AWS services and tools available to help you uh, to get started with Gen AI, and she will also share some of the uh, resources you can uh, use to get started your generative AI journey. Um, given that, uh, let's get started. Uh, machine learning is at an inflection point. Uh, what do we mean by that? Um, you know, machine learning have existed for decades. 
uh, but with recent uh, steadily available ready and uh, scalable compute capacity increases and then um, uh, you know large growth of data and then advancements in ml techniques have led our customers to use uh, machine learning to transform their business uh, and then <clears throat> generative ai uh, has like you know, captured everyone's attention and imaginations uh, so we believe uh, generative ai is going to uh, transform every uh, business and then um, you know, we look at what is generative ai okay generative ai is like uh, you know any other ai uh, it's powered by a machine learning model uh, but it's powered by a large machine learning model called foundation models uh, generative ai uh, can um, you know create original content and ideas uh, including audio video story images and conversations Uh, so when you talked about foundation model, uh, how that is different from the regular machine learning models, uh, I would say there are three key uh, advantages of uh, like a three differences uh, between the regular machine learning models and foundation models. Uh, one uh, is the number of parameters supported like are used by the foundation models. Uh, so you can think the, the parameters is equivalent to the model sophistications. So the larger the number of uh, parameters it supports, uh, it starts ex exhibiting some behaviors that is not, be uh, not known before. Uh, so in 2019, uh, the state-of-the-art uh, machine learning algorithm supported 330 million parameters. In 2021, it went to one, uh, you know, it's become 175 billion. And then uh, 2022, it become 540 billion. Uh, that is like 1600 times increase in just three years. Uh, so uh, also along with this number of uh, parameters increase, uh, there are a couple more, uh, uh, you know, uh, innovations that helped in the foundation model. Uh, one is uh, in-context learning. I'll, I'll just cover that in the couple of slides uh, after. And then the other one is, uh, um, you know, uh, the other one is the number of parameters we looked at it. Uh, let's look at where does the generated AA fit in. Uh, AA is like a way to represent uh, any system uh, that needs... Uh, that, that can replicate the task that requires a human intelligence. Um, like we, I know in the previous example, we are trying to predict something. So similar to that, AA is a, you know, like a try to predict something with a high confidence. Most of the AA use cases will be predicting uh, some kind of use cases with high confidence. Within that, almost all AA systems are implemented using uh, machine learning. Machine learning uh, is, uh, is, a, is a technique that uses a large data set to come up with the decision logic or decision tree uh, that's called model. Uh, within that uh, machine learning, uh, some of the models are deep learning models uh, that employs a deep neural network that's a multi layered neural networks that can do complex logic similar to uh, how the human brain works. So it can do uh, speech and image recognitions. Uh, within that, like our generative AI comes in, generative AI are usually powered by large uh, models. Uh, uh, those are trained on a vast corpora of data. Uh, that's also commonly referred as foundation models. Okay. So these are some of the use cases for generative AI. I think everybody kn knows about the text generation. Uh, so you can give a prompt and then it can give a blog or story or you know, conversations and other stuff. Uh, code generations, like uh, that's getting famous among the developers. Uh, you can just give a a couple of comments in the code, or you can uh, give a prompt and then it'll uh, create a, a code segment for you. And then on the image generation, uh, you know, like you can say, hey, I want to generate an image of uh, astronaut riding on a moon so it can generate an image. So based on the prompt, uh, it can generate images uh, and much more, a lot of other use cases. Let's look at the use, uh, use cases from an industry perspective. Uh, since, you know, I support healthcare license uh, customers, I'll talk with the healthcare. Um, uh, so uh, it can, you know, uh, it changed the way, uh, you know, how uh, life science customers uh, do a protein folding analysis and then the, the drug development. And it also sped up uh, the personalized medicine. Uh, you know, the personalized medicines, uh, we generate a medicine based on the human DNA and other biomarkers that improved the way, how the, uh, improved the speed of the personalized medicine generation. Uh, on the medical imaging side, 
you know, recently a study was uh, published to uh, develop a 3D uh, view of organization, uh, sorry, 3D view of the organs uh, based on uh, all the 2D X-ray images. That helps physicians to diagnose the uh, diseases quickly and a lot of other use cases like that. Okay. Um, uh, let's look at some of the um, real life, uh, you know, already real production use cases for text uh, on the Cohere and AI21 labs Vatune. Uh, it, it's a text, uh, so you can give a prompt, uh, sorry, uh, it's a text uh, summarization. Uh, so it saves you time in uh, reading like entire paragraph, it'll give a gist of the paragraph. Uh, you know, you can give a blog or a story and then it'll give a gist what the uh, story is uh, trying to tell you. And then on the uh, AI21 slab Vatune, it helps you in uh, writing an email or composing a, a statement. Uh, you can choose, you know, what kind of tone you want that uh, message has to be. So it will come up with that, uh, you know, writing for you. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, image uh, example uh, uh, generated by the stable diffusion 2.0. Um, for this image, uh, we gave the photo of a living room and then uh, the furniture was not there before. We asked the model to add the furniture. And then when it added the furniture, um, it can um, uh, account for the sun uh, rays coming in, sunlight coming in, and then uh, creating the shadows and other stuff. And then on the right side top, if you see, like we asked a uh, you know, model to put together uh, glasses on the persons, it can account for the 3D depth, and then it can properly uh, put a specs on those images. And on the upscaling side, like uh, it can also upscale the images uh, uh, up to four times. Uh, so that's going to help, like, you know, all the photos taken 10, 20 years ago, it was like a grainy that can be upscaled uh, to a you know, <clears throat> bright looking, uh, you know, images. Let's look at one more example of the clothing design. Um, uh, LG created this uh, Exxon uh, foundation model uh, that's used for uh, creating a clothing design based on a set of images. Um, uh, so this, before this image, uh, it used to take nine months for them to come up with a clothing design. Uh, after this, with this image, they're able to reduce the time taken to generate a new um, design to one month. So it's basically it's reduced it from nine months to one month. And then this model was built using SageMaker distributed training uh, to build this model. Uh, it was built on large uh, data. Uh, so it took some time for them to build this model, but it reduced the time from nine months to one month. Let's look at, you know, why foundation model? What's the difference? Uh, in the traditional model, um, I think like the previous use case, uh, we look at the label data. Uh, like, uh, so for example, for the bike, so we look at the weather data and then the bike data, and then choose the uh, machine learning model that's appropriate for that label, for the use case. Like if it's a text generation use case, we'll try to, uh, pick a model that's appropriate for the text generation and then for identify the corresponding data and then train the model and then deploy the model to perform a specific task like text summarization or uh, information extraction and uh, et cetera. On the foundation, uh, on the generative AI use case in the foundation model, we are going to fit the foundation model with like uh, all data, like it can be structured and structured and then it's, it's going to be unlabeled data. You don't need to say, oh, this is a weather data, this is a bike data. So you're going to give all the data into the foundation model. And then the foundation model is going to land that. And then it can be easily adopted to do any type of broad range of task. Uh, so you have to give, uh, as part of uh, you know, invoking the model, you are going to give a prompt saying that, hey, I want this output. So the model can customize, adopt to, to that uh, requirement and then uh, generate it. I'll just quickly touch on those three uh, ML techniques that helped uh, to the rise of this foundation model. So one is the in-context learning. Um, in the traditional ML model, um, so once you build the model, you have to retrain the model with another set of label data to keep it up to date. Um, but in the foundation model case, when you, um, you know, a query or when you request the foundation model, you can provide some sample input, like, you know, this is an example, and then it, it can use that example to train as part of the inference itself, like it's say in context uh, learning. So it can learn with a very minimal compute power, with minimal data, it can learn as part of the uh, you know, uh, task itself. And then the second, we talked about the number of parameters increase. 
Uh, so it's going to, based on the unlabeled data, it's going to, the number of parameters uh, are high. Uh, that's the main difference between foundation model and the ML models. And uh, let's look at, and the third one is the uh, transformer-based architecture. Uh, so the invention of the transformer-based architecture is uh, really helpful on the FM side. Uh, so with the transformer-based architecture, it's easy to uh, uh, scale and then uh, do the parallel load, uh, training of the model, the parallel load. And also uh, it's easy to model the interdependence between the input and an output. Let's want to see how it works. Uh, so I'm going to take a, a unlabeled data. It can be a video, audio, uh, text, uh, uh, a, a, any of the bio models, any of the data, and then load that into foundation model. And then it can be easily adopted to uh, do a broad range of tasks. Okay. So let's look at some of the uh, foundation model categories. Uh, one is a text to text that like, like everybody is aware of that. Uh, Basically, you can give a prompt uh, to generate a story or prompt to generate a blog and other stuff. Also, you can do a, a, a text extraction, text summarization. Those all will fall under the text to text foundation model. And then the second category is a text to embedding uh, that will be used in uh, searching a context, uh, searching for a word. Like for example, like uh, you know, some, uh, some user types a word uh, in a, a search box. And then the text embedding model will convert that to a numerical representation. And then that numerical representation can be used against, uh, to search against the corporate, uh, like a proprietary databases. And then the third one is a multi-model. The stable diffusion is one of the examples. And then, so that uh, model can handle uh, video, uh, audio, uh, and then it can also generate video, audio, and uh, sorry, images and videos and audios based on the prompts. Those are multi-model examples. So let's talk about some of the challenges with this uh, you know, current uh, foundation models. So we classify the foundation models into like these three category. One of them is the proprietary models. Those are models owned by a, a corporate and then that's like a, given access to end users using an API. And then the other one is a publicly available models. Uh, so like those like are free to use, but you can uh, you know, uh, like some, most of the models will be available in hugging, uh, hugging phase will be foundation or publicly available models. So you can uh, get that and then use that in your AWS account and other stuff. Third one is uh, building your own models from scratch. So what are the challenges with those? Uh, so in the proprietary model, uh, you don't know how your data is going to be used, correct? Like uh, you don't have a control over uh, how your data is going to be used for the training that foundation models. And then how can you customize that? So because if it is available on API, do you have a capability to customize that? And then how secure the, your data is going to be when you use a proprietary model. And then if you look at the second one, the publicly available models, you need to do uh, some uh, you know, substantial or undifferentiated work to take the model and then deploy that into some compute environment and then uh, make it uh, productionalize it. The last one is a more challenging one. Uh, so you have to build uh, your own model. Uh, so you have to collect the data from various sources and then make it available. And then uh, you, know, you need to have a deep expertise in the machine learning to do it. Uh, so I talked about the in-context learning. Uh, so here's one uh, quick, uh, you know, little bit more detail about the in-context learning. Uh, so we are going to give a prompt to the uh, large language model to get an output. So this will be a prompt structure and within the prompt, uh, we're going to say, hey, uh, you know, I want to do this task. Uh, this example is saying, I know this is a movie review. It can also correct the spelling mistakes within the task, right? Like you are saying, yeah, this is a movie review, but the model understands there's a typo in the task description. And then you, uh, you don't need to give an example. Uh, you can just say, hey, I want a movie review, and then I enjoyed this movie. It can come back with an answer. Uh, so if you don't give any example, that's called a zero thought, uh, yeah, zero shot prompting, uh, because you are, uh, so the, you can still give come back with an answer, but sometimes it may not be accurate. Uh, it may not be accurate. So to improve the accuracy, you can also give an example. Uh, so here we gave two examples. So this is called a few shot prompting. Uh, so with this example, the language model can use those two to do a, you know in context learning and then come up come back with the correct answers. Okay. Another uh, just I want to touch on one more. Patterns most of the customers use uh, when they use the foundation models are uh, retrieval augmented generation or RAG. Uh, so in this case, uh, so the la la large language model is like a more generic model. It may not have uh, any information about your corporate 
uh, data. Uh, so what we do, like uh, whatever user entering, um, and then we'll take the prompt and queries, uh, what they're uh, asking for. We'll take the query and then search against the corporate database. It can be a Kendra or any kind of knowledge base, any kind of vector database. You can search and then get the relevant information and take the relevant information and then send that to the large language model. That's like if the enhanced context will be the uh, data coming from your uh, in a customer's database. And then the model will uh, create a customized response based on the enhanced context. And then that will be sent back to the user. Uh, so this is like one of the design pattern uh, to use uh, uh, foundation models along with your own data. So given that context, I'll, I'll hand over to Alec to talk about uh, you know, how AWS can, uh, tools can help with uh, getting started on um, generative AI. Thank you, Suresh. So having talked about what is generative AI and the different use cases, and we talked about the foundational models, uh, let's talk a little bit about why AWS for generative AI. So how can customers uh, quickly uh, start using what's available today and what's likely coming tomorrow in the space of generative AI and start to begin using the foundational models for their business? And they can drive uh, the productivity and also transform their offerings, right? So at AWS, we have uh, five important considerations uh, that can help you to quickly build and deploy generative AI applications at scale. So let's jump into those considerations and see how AWS can help. So first, uh, AWS offers a wide selection of foundational models, both that are built by our uh, leading AI startups and also Amazon provided own models as well. So uh, you have that option to choose the right model that best fits your use case. So second, it should be easy for you to simply take the base foundational models and build a differentiated applications with your own data, right? And in that process, it's important that your data stays safe, secure, and protected. And you must have full control of your data uh, on how your data is being shared and how your data is being used. So with AWS, uh, none of the data is used, none of the customer's data is used to train the underlying models. Uh, and so uh, the data is also encrypted and it does not leave the virtual private cloud. You can be assured that uh, you know, the data is going to be private and confidential within AWS. So next, uh, whatever it is that you want to use your foundational models, right? whether you're running, um, uh, running those models or training them or uh, customizing those models. So it's important to have the best performant and cost effective infrastructure that is purpose built for machine learning. So uh, with AWS Inferentia and uh, Trainium, which is our purpose-built machine learning accelerators. They are built ground up uh, by AWS uh, that can help specifically address uh, training and inferencing on the cloud. So next, it's important uh, to have the ease of use, right? So quickly, customers want to be able to integrate the foundational models into their applications and uh, with some of the controls that they are already familiar with. So for example, instead of with, with using the AWS for generative, with the AWS's generative AI capabilities, uh, it should be easy for you to, uh, you know, uh, take, instead of sending the data to the model, you're able to bring the model to your data. So lastly, building uh, generative AI powered solutions. So with the sample solutions uh, that combine the AI services and uh, some of the foundational models provided by the leading startups, we're able to create that uh, impactful generative AI applications uh, for solving your customer uh, problems. So having talked about why uh, AWS, for, you know, why AWS, uh, we're gonna cover some of the generative AI capabilities that AWS offers. So first we have Amazon Bedrock, uh, you've probably heard about it a lot recently. Um, so Amazon Bedrock is a fully managed service that provides access to the foundational models that are both provided uh, by the leading startups and Amazon's uh, developed models as well. Uh, and just by using an API call, you're able to get access to those foundational models. Second, we have uh, the AWS Trainium and Inferentia chips which allows you to do training and inferencing on the cloud uh, with the best uh, price uh, and uh, performance uh, factors. So third, we have Amazon Code Whisperer. So Amazon Code Whisperer is our AI companion tool 
which uh, helps uh, to generate uh, code. Uh, and uh, it also improves the developer's productivity uh, and by providing a secure code as well. So lastly, we have SageMaker. So for customers who are intending to have the full control over their infrastructure and deployment of the models. So SageMaker is obviously available today and its core value proposition of machine learning can be directly extended to generative AI capabilities as well. So uh, we have uh, Jumpstart, which provides, uh, provides a foundational model hub, which provides access to some of the publicly available foundational models and also the proprietary foundational models as well. So having talked about the various generative AI capabilities, um, I wanna show you uh, the, stack, the AI and ML stack and show from the ease of use and the complexity uh, of where these uh, offerings fit in. So think of this as a three tier stack and at the very bottom of the stack, it's intended to provide a self-managed experience uh, for customers uh, who are very deep in machine learning uh, and they're looking to build a foundational models from scratch. So we have AWS Inferentia and training in that layer. Now next for the set of customers who are looking to uh, get a managed experience and they are looking to develop a generative AI application, but they simply wanna make an API call uh, to the foundational models that are built by the other providers. Uh, SageMaker uh, is a best fit there uh, and SageMaker Jumpstart provides you access to those foundational models which you can simply uh, put together in your generative AI application uh, and develop that uh, you know, uh, quickly for you to get started. So at the very top layer is our AI services uh, that are intended to provide a completely a serverless experience uh, just by using an API. Um, so Amazon Bedrock and Code Whisperer fits in that layer. Uh, and I'd say that's sort of the easiest way to get started uh, to uh, create a generative AI application. Um, so uh, in that layer, you do not have to worry about even deploying an endpoint, uh, managing any of that infrastructure. Um, so the customers can really focus on uh, what is important to their business and AWS will take care of all the undifferentiated heavy lifting uh, for you. So uh, let's dive a little bit into Amazon Bedrock. So Bedrock is the easiest way uh, to build and uh, scale generative AI applications. Um, so uh, some of the benefits uh, that uh, Bedrock provides, the first differentiator uh, in the market is that uh, it, 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 it helps to improve uh, the productivity. So by providing a serverless experience, uh, for example, say you're looking to develop a text-to-text -text application, right? Uh, you're simply having to provide text as an input and Bedrock will invoke the large language model behind the scenes and just provide the text as a response back on an API call. So uh, the next differentiator is the wide selection of foundational models that's available for you to use in your application. So thirdly, Bedrock also allows you to customize your own data on top of the base models uh, that's, uh, that can be accessed through the bedrock. So next, it's also important to call out that we have all the security capabilities that are built in. Um, so your data is encrypted, it doesn't leave the virtual private cloud, uh, and it provides you the confidentiality that you require for your own data. Lastly, using the AWS tools and capabilities that you're familiar with, uh, it's easy for you to quickly uh, put together a generative AI application. So what does Bedrock support? Uh, what sort of foundational models are now provided, right? Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the foundational models provided by Amazon. So we have uh, Titan text and Titan embeddings. Titan text large language model uh, is used for use cases like text generation, um, text summarization, open-ended Q&A, uh, and if you're looking, for example, to create a blog post, um, you can uh, leverage uh, Titan text for such use cases. And then we have Titan embeddings, uh, which takes text as an input and it can create embedding as an output. And uh, this is useful for scenarios uh, that Suresh previously covered, uh, like retrieval augmented generation sort of use cases and also semantic search use cases. 
So what's really powerful there is that being able to uh, create those embeddings uh, when you're leveraging these large language models for search and personalization sort of use cases, uh, you can uh, really uh, get a contextual response uh, rather than simply doing a word matching. And then uh, the uh, leading AI startups uh, like AI21 Labs providing um, Jurassic 2, uh, which is really helpful when it comes to multilingual use cases. And we have Claude provided by Anthropic. Uh, if you're looking for some sort of uh, chatbot and uh, you know, dialogue-based scenarios, Claude's been very powerful. Uh, and if you're looking to create images using text, stable diffusion provided by stability.ai uh, is another uh, use case there. So uh, with uh, Amazon's Titan, uh, we talked about Titan text and Titan embeddings. Uh, the important thing that I want to call out here is that uh, Titan supports the responsible use of AI. Um, so by able to reduce the inappropriate or harmful content, either in the data set that's being used for training, or uh, you know, uh, if there is a user input that may have some sort of a inappropriate content, uh, they'll be removed. Um, and similarly, the output of the model has any sort of hate speeches or uh, any violent content, those will be filtered out as well. So these are the different, uh, you know, the AI startups and the models that are provided that can be leveraged within Amazon Bedrock. And Bedrock also provides the ability to fine tune uh, and customize the models using your own data set. So next uh, we have uh, Amazon AWS's Trainium and Inferentia. So these are the purpose-built machine learning accelerators. They're the silicon chips that are built ground up. Uh, the important thing to call out here, uh, AWS Trainium uh, can provide up to 50% savings on training cost, and uh, Inferentia 2 provides up to 40% better price performance than the other comparable EC2 instances. The next we're gonna talk about Amazon Code Whisperer. So Code Whisperer uh, is an AI coding companion uh, and it's been uh, trained uh, with uh, billions of lines of code, both by Amazon and open source code. So uh, the developer productivity can be enhanced and freeing up the developer's time to really focus on some of the things uh, that's really important uh, for the business uh, facing use cases that they can focus better. Um, so it's, uh, it's already available, uh, generally available, and it's free to use for individual developers. Um, so I definitely recommend that you uh, check out Amazon Code Whisperer. Uh, it's natively integrated uh, in our Cloud9 um, IDE and also AWS Lambda console. Um, it's also ex uh, available as an extension uh, in uh, Visual Studio and uh, IntelliJ IDEs. Um, and, uh, one of the things that was found out during the preview uh, that Amazon ran, uh, it was found to be 27% more likely to complete tasks successfully. Um, so then also uh, average of 57% faster than who did not use Code Whisperer. Um, Code, Code Whisperer also supports uh, the programming languages like Python, Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, and uh, 10 other programming languages today. And um, it can take prompt as an input. So for example, uh, I, I should be able to pass a prompt saying, hey, pass me the CSV file and extract the second field and sort by descending order and put together the unit test, right? So Code Whisperer can do that for you by generating full lines of code or uh, function suggestions within your IDE. So lastly, we have Amazon SageMaker. So as I mentioned before, a SageMaker's core value proposition um, that it provides on machine learning is directly extendable to generative AI capabilities. Uh, so for example, let's say you're uh, creating a generative AI application with a model that is involving billions of parameters. Uh, most likely you're gonna be needing some sort of a distributed training libraries, right? So, and with SageMaker uh, distributed training libraries and model parallelism, uh, it provides a very powerful uh, way to uh, you know, train and deploy those models uh, and create a generative AI experience. And uh, something important to call out here is our partnership with Hugging Face 
Hugging Face is a model provider and uh, the open source uh, models, uh, foundational models and other models are available for you to bring to SageMaker for both training and deployment. So uh, having talked about SageMaker, uh, what does Jumpstart provide? Right, so SageMaker Jumpstart can be leveraged uh, for self-managed access. So uh, you have uh, ability to access the publicly available foundational models provided by Stability AI, Alexa, Hugging Face, and also the proprietary models provided by our leading uh, AI startups like AI21 Labs, Lighton, and Cohere. So there are three different ways to use the foundational models within SageMaker uh, Jumpstart. So one, you can leverage SageMaker Studio uh, using a one-step deployment process. Second, if you're looking to do some sort of a fine tuning, uh, you can leverage uh, SageMaker notebooks. And lastly, uh, our AWS management console uh, on our SageMaker console page. Uh, on the left-hand side, if you go to Jumpstart, uh, you can uh, get into the uh, foundational model hub uh, through the Jumpstart uh, foundational models page. So what is coupling with SageMaker Jumpstart? It provides you a one place where you're able to browse both the publicly available and the proprietary foundational models. And you can start doing some experimentations on the UI interface uh, that we're providing um, uh, on the SageMaker Jumpstart. And then you're also having the ability to customize those foundational models, some of the select customized models, and then deploy that to a SageMaker endpoint. So with that, uh, I wanna leave you with some of the useful resources uh, that can help you get started uh, with your Generative AI journey. Uh, so do check out our uh, AWS Generative AI webpage, our announcement blog post, and the video uh, from uh, Werner Vogels, our CTO, that's explaining uh, Generative AI. Uh, and I've also included uh, an uh, interesting blog post which showcases the real life example um, what we call as an image to speech technology that we built. Um, it's intended to help the visually impaired to be able to hear an image. So uh, an image, uh, you'll feed image as an input and uh, the caption of the image will be described back to you in a human sounding voice. So check out a blog post uh, on that. And it also includes a reference uh, architecture if you're looking, if you're interested. And with that, uh, that kind of takes us to the end of the presentation. Um, thank you so much. And uh, you can find our um, you know, uh, LinkedIn uh, profile and our uh, email addresses over here. Um, I don't know how we're running on time, but uh, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us in the hallway. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you all for uh, listening to us. Uh, thank you for uh, you know all the community leaders for uh, organizing this event. I think we are almost run out of time. Uh, so yeah, feel free to reach us uh, in the hallway or during the happy hours. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's still a bit small group, so we can make this really interactive at the end. Um, my name is Ashley Romatko. I'm the VP of Operations for the FinOps Foundation. That's really just a fancy title to say that I'm really passionate about FinOps. Um, I didn't get to see everybody raise their hand earlier. How many people know what FinOps is? Okay, good. I've got some people. So I'll do a little intro of it, and then I'll kind of give some examples throughout this presentation. Um, I've been part of FinOps unofficially for maybe about seven years um, before it was maybe a title out there. I actually came to the AWS Community Day back in 2018, and I think if I would have said FinOps, everyone would have looked at me like, what are you talking about? Um, so it's been really interesting to see the advancements in just the last four years. Um, typically, we've seen FinOps be like a bottom-down approach, a bottom-up approach. So one individual that's like, I've been tasked with doing the bill, I need to know what these reservations are, and to kind of do it as part of their job. That's how it started for me as well. Um, lately, with all the kind of economic uncertainty, we're actually seeing a lot more top-down pressure on developing a FinOps practice within organizations, and so I'll talk through a little bit about that today. Um, so I work for the FinOps Foundation. We're a not-for-profit organization. If you're familiar with the Linux Foundation, we are a project of that. So I like to say our big brother, big sister is CNCF. Um, they've been there a little bit longer than us since we've only been with the foundation for about three years. Um, what we focus on is building a vibrant community around practitioners. So we have about 10,000 people in our community. This involves the cloud providers. Um, this involves vendors in the community and people that are in enterprises developing FinOps as a practice. Uh, we host a bunch of events throughout the year. We do speaking engagements like this. Uh, we have a Slack community where we really share a lot of best practices. 
And then we're mostly funded by our partners and our certification program. A little bit more about our mission. So we're focused on creating connections. So how do we get people um, that are working in different oil and gas companies doing FinOps talking to each other? They probably have the same problems. How do we get banks connected to each other? Uh, we focus on the inspiring career growth. This is actually a field where there are more positions open right now than there are people to fill them. And so we're heavily focused on like, how do we get more people in diverse backgrounds into FinOps? How do we um, make this a career path? We actually saw this last year, someone um, officially titled a VP of FinOps at Goldman Sachs. So that's excited to start to see kind of that hierarchy being developed. And then the other thing we focus on is empowering best practices. So that's anything from developing playbooks, um, white papers. A big focus of the foundation is called Focus right now. And we're working with all, all three cloud provider on how do we really standardize the billing output um, and make it a lot more accessible to be trained on how to uh, process it. So that's a little bit about the foundation. Today, I'm going to uh, back up a little bit and talk about the fact that DevOps, SRE, and um, public cloud uh, really broke IT procurement and traditional IT and explain why that happened and how do we fix that, that feeling that it's left. So to back us up a few years ago, <laughs> um, we, we traditionally had platform teams that are like, I need hardware and software. They go to maybe a procurement team to get it. They get finance involved. They create a business case. They get the money that they need to secure that funding. Um, this was a very linear procurement process. If you've been through it before, it was very time consuming to happen, but costs were very predictable. You knew what you needed. You put in a business case. That's exactly what you were going to buy and resources were known. So it kind of felt like this. It was just an assembly line that took a long time to kind of get through, but high confidence um, in what we were buying. Um, from the, the consumption model here, engineers were the requesters at this time. Uh, finance were the approvals, kind of the, lock, the gate. And then the spend was very, very predictable and static. Like you bought it, you knew you were gonna decommission it over 10 years. Very long procurement cycles and is a very high cost of failure. So if you wanted to develop an application or get a product to market, you are doing a heavy investment to do that. If you have something that um, is very cyclical, you're having to invest in that um, hardware all up front and maybe only use it a couple times a year. So the cloud really changed this dynamic because now we have all these service teams that are able to deploy code whenever they want to get to the money. And so they're really going around procurement and finance. So what that looks like is more of a decentralized model where any engineer can um, provision that has access, the cost is very variable and any minute someone can spin something up that costs $8 to $8,000 um, and really scalable, almost an infinite scale. So now you have in uh, the finance team and procurement feeling like this is what's happening. So with that being said, engineers now can spend money with code. That sounds really exciting. <laughs> you hire an intern tomorrow, they can spend something up. Finance is kind of panicky. They have less visibility. Dynamic, the spend is dynamic, but very much less predictable. So when finance organizations are traditionally used to getting like five-year um, forecasting, putting a five-year forecasting on cloud, you're, you know, your percent of being accurate is maybe 20%, right? And so there's some good things happening though. We're able to be more agile, more experimental, should be less waste, right? Because you don't have to procure stuff and have it sit around there. You can just buy what you need to use at that time. But there feels like a lack of communication. There's some tension that's happening between the IT um, development teams and the finance teams, the procurement. And what you end up seeing is people just being like, we'll just tighten the budget. We'll just give you less money to spend but you're giving them less money to spend, but they're just spending it anyways, right? So this is where we, um, we look at those things that are happening. So decentralized buying power happening, things are getting very, very expensive. They say 24% year over year increase in public cloud. We're also seeing where cloud spend, you know, was maybe traditionally in the 3% of your entire IT budget. I think there's predicting up into 13% to, to high 20%. Very variable spend, and we're seeing a lot more inefficiency happening. So this is where we need to get these teams together and collaborating. I like to call this the FinOps hug. So sometimes it's just getting these three personas in a room and getting them to talk and plan a little bit better together. We need to improve that requester approval relationship. So I'll give you an example. Um, when I worked at previously for Pearson, it's a big, large education company. If you take your um, uh, AWS certification, you probably took it on a Pearson platform. Um, you know, we wanted to heavily use the marketplace, 
but we still needed to work with our procurement organization and our software asset management relationship to make sure we had those contracts in place. We had checked all of our legal due diligence. And so we had to figure out a request and approval relationship that let us use the marketplace, but still follow the processes that um, we need to fiduciary and audit and audit wise be held accountable to. We need more spend visibility. The fact that we can spend in like near real time, we need to see data in near real time as well. We need to be able to predict or at least get more accurate about our predictions. Um, and we need to speed up the procurement cycle as well. We can't be a bottleneck to engineers to getting um, work done. And all of this will help, help lessen the impact of failure. So about four years ago, uh, the first time FinOps was used was in a blog actually that AWS wrote. And over time, it's really been picking up speed. Um, so really cloud FinOps is involving cloud financial management practice and discipline that is really bringing together engineers and finance to come together and make real-time decisions with real-time data about the, va the data, data value decisions in real time. So I want to debunk something because sometimes when people hear the word FinOps, they think, oh, you guys are the cost optimization people. You're the people that are going to tell me to right size and save money. Yes, you're also going to be told to do those things, but we're going to help you make better decisions. We're going to get data in front of you. We're going to take your best practices and help propagate them throughout the rest of the organization as well. Um, again, another question I get a lot is like, is FinOps a team? Maybe it could be. Um, when I was at Pearson, I had a team of about 11 people. That was a variety of a data scientist, data, analy data analyst, program managers. Um, so I had a fairly big team. Um, Target is one of the biggest teams that I've seen so far. They've got about 20 people. And the reason they have such a huge team is they're actually building their own product. Um, talking to one of the largest hotel um, uh, uh, companies around here and they have one person doing FinOps on their, their team. So it really depends. You have to build your FinOps practice based on what your organization um, structure is and what you need. It's also based a lot on spending. So we typically see people that are spending more money, have more dedicated resources. Also complexity. So if you've got multi-cloud, you may need to have special, specialists across those clouds. I also like to say that it's a team sport because it's so important that you're working with your cloud provider. I will say when I was at Pearson, my AWS uh, TAM was like my best friend. We were calling each other the night before Christmas to make huge savings plan purchases together, right? So you have to use them as part of the team as long, along with finance executives, products, and engineering. Just like any type of practice, it's very common to have some type of framework. So you're all probably very familiar with the well architected framework. FinOps, we have our own framework as well. I won't go through all the details on this, but um, we do have a set of core principles that we live by. I always tell everyone that's doing FinOps, print this out, put this in front of you, and make sure you're following these as you're having your conversations. We talk a lot about maturity. And so oftentimes people come in and they're like, I need to be all in those things. And I was like, just start with one thing and do the whole crawl, walk, run to get your stuff to your, um, in a running state. Um, we talk, also talk about a lot about going through phases. So you really need to be sure you're informing engineers, so collecting and getting the data, and then you need to be doing the optimizing. So one of the things that I see sometimes people be is like, I just took all this data from trusted advisor and it tells me that you can right size all these instances. Why don't you go do that, right? That's not a productive conversation. So you need to be having those conversations about, I have all this information. Can you help me filter this out and figure out what we need to ignore or what we think we can do? And what are those timelines we can do those in? And what are the other constraints that you might have on your backlog or your development cycle? And then um, going into the operate, which is to actually action on those um, recommendations. So I won't go through all of this. We actually do a whole course on this, but I wanted to dig a little bit further into this bottom half here, which is our domains and capabilities. Um, and I think hopefully this will kind of explain to you all what a FinOps team does. So I like to say the green boxes here, um, this is what FinOps should be answering for the business. So they should be saying to the executives in the business, we are making real-time decision-making and here are examples of that. We know what our rate optimization should be in RB, and we're tracking that stuff. We are optimizing our cloud usage, and here is that output of that. Here are the teams that are doing really well. Here are some of the worst offenders. Here is why we are not tackling these type of optimizations. The team should be answering, where are our organizational alignment gaps? Um, one that I faced is a lot with working with our, um, our TBM organization right away we needed to come up with a naming and tagging standard that also aligned to what they had in their naming and tagging standard when they're bringing in revenue data. And so making sure you have those organizational alignments. We're seeing a lot more of that around sustainability for us lately, especially in EMEA space. 
And um, other areas that we're seeing some organizational alignment is with ITAM security. Um, but at the end of the day, the FinOps team is responsible for answering the question of understanding our cloud usage and cost and making sure that's getting allocated out correctly. So I like to tell people that the green up here or what the FinOps practice should be answering for the business. And then all the white things are really the activities that the FinOps and acts through collaboration together. Um, there are 18 of these capabilities. I'm not gonna go over them in detail, but I thought I would pick a few that are been showing in our top challenges. So every year we do a state of FinOps survey about to a thousand people. And we ask, you know, what's going on in your business and what are you struggling with? And that's at data.finops.org. But I wanted to pull the top challenges. Um, one of the one that's at the top is empowering engineers to take action. This is actually down from last year, which means our FinOps groups and teams have gotten a lot closer to the engineers and being able to make some of those change decisions together. We have a long way to go on this. We have some language barriers to work through. We have some getting the data into to the engineers to work through. Other areas has come up as getting to unit economics, which we'll talk about in a minute, getting the organization to adopt FinOps. And then um, I'll also touch a little bit on governance and policy as well. So throughout the rest of this presentation, I, I wanna pull just three of those capabilities and give you some real world experience into it. So let's start with unit economics. So unit economics is really looking at the unit cost and looking at your revenue and trying to figure out where that break even point is. This is, we used to call this Nirvana of FinOps. Like this would be great if you got to the someday, but we ended up writing a new book on FinOps, uh, the second edition recently, and we switched our tone where we're like, actually, you should be thinking about unit economics from day one of building your applications. Um, what I like about unit economics is it's really kind of sometimes difficult for an engineer to be like so focused on the revenue side of things or thinking about the customer side, but unit economics kind of brings that to the forefront. I think unit economics also allows to kind of gamify a little bit a metric. I get that question a lot of like, what's the one efficiency metric? And it's like, well, you could look at CPU, you could look at memory, you could look at reservation coverage. But I think that you, looking at your unit economic number and trying to challenge yourself to lower that um, is, a, is a better use of time. So I'm gonna dive a little bit into this. Um, I did wanna show kind of what this looks like to crawl, walk, run. So when you're starting with unit economics, you might be first just figuring out, do I have the data? Do I even have enough data to tell me what's tagged? Um, related to what a customer is using. And then you may move into, okay, I've got this data. Um, can I figure out what the cost per consumption is of this? Then can I figure out what the cost per demand is? And you might have to bring in some like telemetry data to sort that out too, especially if you're using big platforms. And then finally, you wanna get to the point where I can say the cost per demand of fully loaded cost. And that's where you're gonna to need to bring in some of your revenue allocation. This isn't always easy for a lot of large organizations to do because their FinOps team might not have access to this. So I like to tell people too, maybe you're only gonna to get to the crawl pace where you can only know your unit, economic, your unit metric. I lost my notes in front of me. So let me give you a real example just to kind of um, tie this into. So when I was working at Pearson, um, we uh, have really big testing platforms that are being used by states. So we have a lot of state contracts. And so we started looking at like, what is um, the students per month that are using this platform? And these numbers are really small. We're talking, you know, five, 10, $50 million, 50 million students, depending on which state you're in. So we would see something like this happen every spring. So just like Amazon has their Black Friday, Pearson with um, elementaries would have this thing happen where in March they have a lot of their students testing. So this is what we would see happening. The, nobody's really testing in January, right? Still on holiday. Um, we'd have some school districts start in February, the majority in March, and then start dropping off. But if we start looking at our spend, this is what we're seeing. We're spending quite a lot of money on, in January and May when we don't have a lot of people testing. Is that our baseline? Is that the lowest that we can go on running this infrastructure? We also see a big spike in February, but we're not have that many people testing quite yet. And we still are lingering a lot of costs in April when most of our students are off testing. So by using and looking at this data, we were able to do a couple things. First, we're able to see um, what's going on in February. Our engineers are doing what we call the iron triangle. They're making the trade-off that we would rather not end up in the newspaper because a million seven-year-olds couldn't test. So we're gonna scale up really high pre-warm and we're gonna be ready for the big testing days. So they were making that, that trade-off on cost with not a lot of information on when testing days were happening. 
The other thing that was happening in April is they were just getting to shutting things off when they could. It was like, we'll get to it later. We don't actually know when they've stopped testing. So we'll, we'll think about it in April and go around and ask the product owners if they're done testing. So that's kind of the behavior that was happening. So um, what we looked at is that was costing $1.18 per student. So that's that unit metric that I was talking about. So just to have one student take this is $1.18. When we started implementing some changes, um, well, we're gonna actually create a dashboard that tells us the completion rate per state and per district. So we can actually start turning off things a little bit quicker. Um, you didn't see some of these numbers drop down, but um, we're, we're actually gonna not pre-warm as big in February because we learned some of these schools don't start testing until the third week of March. So by being able to have this data and have these conversations with the business, the engineering teams felt more empowered to take actions than ever. And then you can see the cost per student went down to $1.10. Now you're thinking that's not a big change, but it's a big change when you're talking millions and millions of students. And so what I'm able to do is the next RFP that comes in for the state of Ohio, I can say, well, based on previous experience, it costs a dollar 10 per student. You're talking about testing 10 million students. I can give a better estimate of what that's going to cost to run that infrastructure during those months as well. The other thing we allowed us to do is we were able to identify some states, I won't say which one, uh, that was costing $3 per student very small state. So that was really concerning. Why is that happening? We learned that there was in the largest district in that state, some behavior happening by the administrator, the school administrator, that was, um, they were clearing the cash over the weekend and then ca causing us to re have to uh, download all of the test questions back on a Monday. So the action that they were doing on site was actually driving this up, not something that our engineering was doing. So that was a training opportunity that we could do with the customer to reduce the cost for them. So this is why I like looking at unit metrics. We at Pearson did not ever get to really full unit economics because we still had a gap in connecting revenue back to um, this, but I, I'm hopeful that that's where they're getting over time. Next thing I wanna to talk to you all about is a little bit policy and governance. I like this kind of quote here, which is policy is what we want to happen and governance is how we make it happen. Something I sometimes see in FinOps is people are like, we'll just throw more governance at it and we'll be better at FinOps. It doesn't work when you try to do that with security and it doesn't always work when you try to do that with FinOps. And so you have to weigh some of these decisions. I've seen people come in and say, we're only gonna let them build on this one instance type, or they're gonna have to provision instances, but they've got to track all that in service now. A lot of these trade-off discussions need to be happening with the FinOps teams, the engineering teams, and the business teams of what makes sense. I'm gonna dive through an example, a real world example that um, was successfully done. So, I had gone to my AWS rep and said, hey, I really need to find some easy wins quickly. I got to hire another person. I need to find about $200,000 in savings so I can get that person hired. They said, you know, have you looked at this incomplete multi-upload thing? We, we kind of noticed that you have a lot of that going on. And I think you guys can clean that up. Um, so we took it through our process of inform, optimize, and operate that I talked away at the beginning. So what I knew is that we had 800 AWS accounts we had no lifecycle uh, rule on how to configure the S3 buckets around the incomplete, incomplete multi-part uploads. We were spending about 11K per month, but no more than a thousand in one account. So it was very distributed that it was happening. So the FinOps team, we wrote up a policy and we submitted it to our cloud governance board. Some might be the cloud center of excellence for you. And we said, we think that we should do this, but we're not just gonna go throw it in there and then hope it works, right? We went to this, this a committee that had engineers on it, security, and had the discussion. They're like, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do it. Wrote a cloud custodian policy that went out and, and took action after 14 days. And we allowed some teams to be able to opt out. Not one of them chose to opt out after about a year. Um, and so this is an example of, of putting together some governance where you can say, this is what we'd like to happen, and then putting the policy in place. So what we were able to see is this whole time we kept increasing our multi-part upload in our S3 across all of our accounts. Then we put the policy in place, took a little bit to go into effect. So we're able to say in the month of June, we think there was a 4K potential savings that was done. And then now that it's in place going forward, I think we end up only spending like 97 cents on this. Um, so we could say year, for the end of the year, we were able to avoid $70,000. These are important concepts to have with your, your, your uh, finance team because 
I'm, I was not allowed to say that I saved $70,000. I avoided it because I made this happen during this time. I was able to count this much of savings. And so those are terms that you're going to want to work out with your finance organization as well. I've definitely seen or, uh, FinOps organizations go in and say, we've saved all of this money. And they're like, mm, but it's, it wasn't spent. So you didn't really spend, save it yet. So, uh, but that's a real live example. Um, very productive. It was able to help get me a head count to find more of these things. The last thing I kind of want to touch on before I do some Q&A is education enablement. Um, this is where, again, we've seen with what's going on in the economy, uh, more executives are coming to us and being like, we think we need to have FinOps as a strategy. How do we adopt that? Uh, there's probably, if you're you know, working in an organization, there's probably a lot more pressure on to save costs lately than there's been in the past. And so to kind of get started with that, you do need an education enablement program. And so I really recommend defining your training needs. Um, AWS has an AWS skills guild that kind of goes through this and helps you uh, kind of pinpoint where you need some training. Um, and then you can help, you know, facilitate that. You can actually look at building and benchmarking as well. Um, we, we have an open source tool called assessment.finops.org where you actually go through an assessment with like your core teams and then your, um, your business unit teams and figure out what areas they need to improve. Uh, I ran this with JP Morgan not too long ago. And one of the areas that they needed to hone in on was um, their forecasting. And the engineers weren't even sure how they were supposed to provide that forecasting data. And so this was something that helped improve their cadence calls with them. Also look for some training, both informal and formal training. So the foundation offers training. Um, at Pearson, we were the first uh, organization to do uh, what AWS calls as fin hacks. So they can come in for three hours and kind of show you how to gamify and get some people in a room to start shutting some things off. Um, we did it when it, we were trying to really train our engineers on how to have more confidence and moving to spot as well. And the last area to look at is like really leverage your cloud provider. So many of you uh, probably have EAs. They can come in and teach and educate your uh, teams on things. There's some really good use cases out there as it relates to all these capabilities to dive into. Um, and then just wanted to leave you all with some additional resources. So I subscribe to the Cloud Financial Management blog. You're always hearing about different price decreases and instances, new functionality that's coming out. If you haven't checked out this open source kudos dashboard, um, you, can, you can go out there and, and deploy this. Oh, I'm forgetting the term of it now, but um, you can go out there, deploy this, and it's basically a live dashboard that shows you all of your cloud spend and you can drill into it. There is keys to optimization. It's a Twitch uh, done by Stephanie Gooch, where she goes on about once a week and kind of uh, interviews various people on what they're doing in their space to optimize. The foundation um, at finops.org, you can join that. Again, we're open source. We're always putting out white books and playbooks. And then we have a FinOps podcast as well, where we go a little bit deeper into um, stories with our different end users. All right, I know that was a lot of information. I just wanna leave you with this, that if you don't have a FinOps practice, you probably should consider it, whether it's one employee or a few employees doing it. Um, while FinOps may have been a buzzword back in 2018, it is a real thing that is here to say. Nine out of the 10 uh, Fortune 500 companies are doing FinOps, 44 of the 50 are, um, about 80% globally. We're seeing a lot of uptick and APAC recently um, starting to adopt this as well. So I'll leave you there um, and see if you all want to ask any questions. I went back there. Yeah, so I previously worked for Pearson, which was a large uh, uh, education company. I actually now work for the FinOps Foundation. Yep, yep, yep. So I work for them now. And so there's a lot of training. There's an edX course that's completely free to take. Um, and then there's like certification if you're looking to get more of like a badge-based training. Uh, we actually just launched a pro course, which is really equivalent to about a college level course. It's about 50 hours of content that you have to go through. Yeah, good question. So there's a couple of different ways. So we have end users that will attend from some of these companies um, and they're really either helping contribute to best practices or they're there to learn about best practices as well. So they're typically coming to our events or they're submitting um, 
uh, use cases to us. Um, I also run something called an enterprise program. So I'm working with some of these large companies and going in and assessing them and um, kind of coaching them through what they're working through. Um, a lot of it is when you have one person doing it and like, how do you get it to expand to the entire organization? And so we will come in and, you know, pitch it to your executive, explain it to your executive if people need help with that too. You can talk to me <laughs> after this. <laughs> Yeah, the assessment is free. It's open source. So it's just assessment.finops.org and you can go and take it. Um, and then, um, yeah, staff can do some guided assessments as well. I'll leave you with a couple extra slides I have here, um, which is, whoops. Uh, I get this question a lot too, like what type of FinOps tools are you using? So when we did the state of FinOps survey, we found that most people are using 4.1 tools to do FinOps. And so that might look something like this. Uh, so native tools using AWS budgets, Azure cost management. Um, they're also using some type of platform tool. Uh, when I was at Pearson, we built a data lake to basically process all of the data through from all the cloud providers. Um, then starting to see a lot more people pulling in observability data from Datadog or New Relic, right? Trying to get that memory and CPU. And then there's a lot of specialty tools. I saw Spot.io is out there as a partner. They're one of our partners too, and they're out there. So a um, lot more um, in the specialty space is coming up. KubeCost is another one really focused on Kubernetes optimization. And if I haven't sold you on it yet, <laughs> there is a demand for more FinOps practitioners. And so part of the state of FinOps um, is we talk about what the size of teams look like. So most organizations that are spending about $8 million annually have a dedicated team of eight. Um, spending under $10 million, you may have a dedicated two. The most common things I hear from people is I'm, it's, I'm doing two jobs, but I would like to do FinOps full time. And the last one, if it's still there, maybe I don't have it there. Oh, but I didn't pull it in. Um, I had a salary slide that I was going to show. Um, the average mean in the US is about 140. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty uh, lucrative <laughs> field to get into. Um, and I think what's nice about it is you can take a lot of people from diverse backgrounds and train them up, right? You can be trained on cloud, you can be trained on how to, you know, be analytical, you can, um, so I actually took someone that was like a third grade teacher and was able to get them to come into FinOps within three years and be trained up. The other thing that's really cool about it is like one day you can be talking with an engineer, the next day you're reporting to a CTO. So there's like that very uh, variety of level of interactions that you're having with organizations too. Cool. Well, I'll take any more. Maybe take one more question if anybody has one. Yeah, that's a good question. It, it depends on your complexity and your size. Uh, it's pretty amazing what we see some people do in one year. They'll join the foundation and they'll be like, I need, I need to fix my chargeback. And we're like, okay, well, here's some playbooks on tagging, get started on tagging. And then they'll like disappear and come back. And all of a sudden they'll be like, yeah, I've fully allocated all my cost out. And we are now have a forecast in place within a year, which is pretty impressive. Um, we've got people that have been in this space for probably five, six, eight years. Uh, and they're, they, they come and go and they've been coming back and being like, okay, now I'm stuck on the sustainability problem. How do we get through that? So there's always another challenge on the horizon. The AI uh, machine learning stuff, like how can FinOps use more of that for like anomaly detection, forecasting? But on the other hand, uh, how, do we, how do we get the organizations ready to adopt it? There's a really good uh, story. Um, I, I'm trying to think if I can say the company name where their, their executive said one day, we're having a whole week where I want everyone to do machine learning and AI. I want you all to take the week and I want you to just explore. Well, they didn't account for what it was going to cost in the cloud, cloud ascent. So it was over hundred thousand dollars that spun up. It was all in one platform. So that one platform team was like, we didn't have budget for this. Like who's paying for this? And so that was something the FinOps team had to figure out of like, okay, let's figure out who, uh, who was logged into these systems, let's charge that out to it, or is it just going to be centrally billed because it was initiated by the CEO? So we're watching a lot of that stuff, what's happening and what it's going to end up costing, um, and how do we forecast that a little bit better too? Yep, it's free to join the foundation. Uh, the way that we uh, are sponsored is by the different partners and then our certification program too. Awesome. Well, thanks. I'll be here throughout the rest of the day. And I think there's a couple other FinOps topics, which makes me super excited. So happy to talk to anybody. You're going better. Okay. Um, two seconds on this. Um, the reason I'm giving this talk is I took my first um, AWS exam in um, 
December of 2015. So I've been doing eight of six AMS for about seven and a half years now. And I'm just trying to share some of the things I've learned and how things have changed over, over the years. Um, did you have a question? Your view is blocked presentation. You're on speaker view. I'm on speaker view. What, 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 what should I do? I'm upper right hand corner is small. Oh, yeah, I see it. There, are we good now? Oh, thank you. Thank you. A little technical difficulties. Um, so I've, I've been doing these a while and I'm just trying to share some of the things I've learned relatively, relatively quickly so that we don't miss lunch. Yeah, that's a lot of certifications. Um, I'm going to cover like seven quick questions here and, and sort of, a, that's why I call it an FAQ. Um, so let's just and I'm, we could have a big discussion about why to take certifications. And when you get the slides, there's a lot of, of, a lot of notes in here that has a lot more detail behind this on the slides. But basically the, the best argument that I've come up with is that certification, you know, if you're a developer, chances are you went to college. Not necessarily, that, that has changed. But what you learn in college and what you learn on the job, actually doing the job, are different things. They're, they're complementary. And so the certifications is like, I, I, th I think the, uh, another session I attended, they said there's over 300 AWS services right now. So think of the certifications as a way of knowing the context and the landscape so you know where to look, what to research, and what to do. And so I don't, I don't think one is a substitute for the other. And that's kind of what I'm, what I'm covering here. Obviously, there's some other advantages as far as um, LinkedIn and people reaching out to you, and, or if you're in a consulting firm, um, it's important for vendor relations and things like that. So, what are the best study resources? I'm going to give you the cliff notes. First of all, I'm going to tell you right. Don't follow that. I'm going to tell you right now that um, the best stuff out there is probably Tutorials Dojo, and there's a link in the slides on that. And what that means is, it's the best example I can give you. When I was studying for the uh, AWS Data Analytics Special Exam. It was, I don't know, 65 questions in the little practice test. And the actual PDF that came out after it scored was 250 pages long. And on those pages were the questions, the links to all the AWS resources and things like that. It was almost like the world's best study guide. So um, I would recommend totally that site. And the other thing I would recommend totally if you have access to it is O'Reilly has these live events, and as part of those live events, they have um, crash courses for various AWS certifications. They're really excellent, and they also combat some other things in the sense that they're up to date, and they'll have lots of other resources, Get get lives, slides, walk you through some of the things to expect and give you sort of latest things. So those are the the best stuff out there. Um, back when I was first doing exams, A Cloud Guru was the gold standard, but right now they're more enterprise focused where they tend to be um, little hot topics, not a whole certification thing, and they don't tend to go into enough depth. We could have another discussion about where you would go if you really want that kind of depth. If, is there any questions yet from the audience about any of this? You know. Raise your hand or stop me or any time. But I'm like I said, I'm trying to make up for a, a late start here. When you should take them. Um, when someone publishes these resources, a lot of times you want to get as close as you can to when when they're timely that the things are updates. Um, exams have a half-life. So whatever study materials you're doing, 
they're going to every six months the test is going to change give or take and so you you kind of kind of want to keep an idea about that um where do you take them um the answer is um it, it depends but the people i've talked to in my personal experience i'd rather do it in a in a testing center there's some points up on the slide here that have to do with what makes a good testing care center or what what you might have to worry about um so i would just i would just say that and you look at the quality and the location and things like that um and talk a little bit about pacing but you you probably have some experience with that i can tell you that um you know what we're trying to tell you is, is, is pacing on the tests, um, stamina for some of the longer tests, the three hour tests that are the specialties and professional ones. Um, no questions, okay. Um, practice tests are really important, but they're not important for the, thing, the reason you might think. What it is is that they're, they're important from a sense of a study guide. So one of, the, one of the suggestions that you have for a study material is AWS FAQs for the various services. One of the things about an FAQ is it's gonna ask frequently asked questions, also turn into topic for frequently asked exam questions. And the same thing happens with these practice tests. What you're having, whoever's doing them is you're having someone, okay, these are the topics, these are the areas, what kind of questions might I have? It's, it's just really, a, really a, uh, a study guide. There's a bunch of, in my examples, there's a bunch of different places you can go. Um, I mentioned tutorial JoJo's, um, Wiz Labs, it varies. Um, the, practice exams that you see in like a call guru or something like that they don't tend to be detailed enough to to really help you know what you want to focus on i have stories if anybody wants to stay for them about what it's like taking beta exams i i generally don't recommend it i took my first beta exam for the advanced networking beta exam back in many years ago. And that was when AWS was first launching specialty exams. And it was uh, a bit of a train wreck because it took them five months to get back to me and whether I passed. And there was some uh, lots of other stuff going on there as well. Um, my other funny one was the machine learning exam. I was at my first reInvent. It was in beta. And for, for money reasons, I was leaving on Thursday. So I couldn't attend really many of the afternoon sessions. So I said, I might as well take exams. So I just took them because it was like free retry or something like that. So it, it, it didn't count. It was almost like a practice exam. So, you know, and I, I passed it with a uh, 750, which I think was the minimum score. Like I just passed it. And it was like, oh, that's great. Uh, three years later, when I renewed it, it was a lot harder. That's the other thing I can say about these exams is it's amazing how they change because the technology changes, of course, and what you have to learn and things also change. Okay, I got to the questions. I was kind of rushing through there. I have a lot, if, if you want, I can go back. If there's any particular area of those topics that you want me to go into more details, I can. Yes, please. Um, it, 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 there's nothing wrong per se with Unity, but, um, and they used to resell all the Cloud Guru ones, it's kind of funny. Um, tutorials, dojos is cheaper and better in the sense that, again, what, what are you trying to get? Are you getting trying to get a bunch of videos to watch? Or are you trying to get some sort of organized set of information? And you, you're going you're, you're gonna to find Tutorial Dojo's is, I don't know, it, it's, it's Udemy priced, and, it's, and they, they work very hard at keeping it up to date. 
that's 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 my take. That's that said, I took a, a Google database engineer exam, and the only place I could find any study materials or practice exams or anything was on Udemy. So it's not that I don't have anything against Udemy or anything like that. It's more like there's different different things. One of the things I could talk about here too, just off the top of my head, is that when you get these certifications, there's a question of whether you're gonna maintain them and what that's gonna take. One of the nice things about AWS is that if you, if you, re if you renew your uh, professional, it renews the uh, corresponding associates and practitioner exams. So you end up only have to take the re re recertifying the pros and the specialties. By the way, for what it's worth, the specialties are probably, I know this is, they're probably harder than the professional ones because they go into a lot more detail and they're just as long. And, and you don't have, the other thing I can say is as you take more of these exams, there's overlap exams. One of the things I noticed when I took the um, um, machine learning exam as a beta was how much the big data and the data analytics stuff was there. And so, you know, I got a bunch of questions, right? That had to do with data prep and, and you know, feature engineering and things that aren't necessarily machine learning. Any more questions? Yes. It depends why you're taking the practice test. If you're taking the practice test to practice, you know, being on a clock and pacing yourself and getting, then then you do them. Uh, you might do them more than once. If if what you're using it is more study materials, what I do is I only do it once. I save it as a PDF, and then I use it as study materials where I just review it. And most of these like Wiz Labs um, will or Tutorial Jojo's will probably have two um, practice exams in there. And I'll do both. And Wiz Labs might, depending on if it's like a pro exam or something like that, they might have five. They might have ones for specific sections and things like that. It all depends. I'll go through all, but I won't do it multiple times because I'll save the results. And really what I want to do is I want to review why I got it wrong, what I didn't understand, and the links to the various AWS documentation and other stuff. One side, of, one side note, sometimes those links aren't to AWS documentation, especially in the special exams like machine learning and the big data. They're, they're going to public sites because the community of data analytics and, and machine learning is far larger than AWS itself. And so they'll link to the appropriate sites. More questions back there. Yes. So the, the, problem, the problem that ACAL Guru has or any of those places is it takes a lot of time and energy to create those videos. And so there's usually like, if they announce a new exam on, uh, that you could take, it might be six months before there were um, a cloud guru training or something like that. If you do these live events, crash courses, he has a set of slides. He's probably taken the exam, the new exam as a beta, or he took it like um, within the last quarter or three months or something. And so he knows exactly what's going on. And so it's going to be up to date in a way that, and he'll, he's not, it's not practicing tests. He'll have little, what if practice, he'll have little, how would you answer this question? And he'll pull the audience and stuff. He'll do a little bit of that, but he's mostly covering the areas and saying, this is what you need to know. This is the level of depth you need to know it. You know, here's my Git, GitHub and, you know, I have all the slides and documentation and links and things like, they'll create sheets of links of things you could go to and study. It's gonna be the, it is the most update thing you can have. That's why. Does that make sense? We have more questions back there. Go ahead. I couldn't quite hear that. Yeah. 
They're, they're excellent. Um, Adrian is excellent. There's no question about that. I, I totally agree with him. I, I used to take Adrian when I was, um, um, when he was with ACOW Guru. I used his materials when he was at Linux Academy. Um, his, his stuff is excellent and I have no issues with it if you want, you know, if, that, if, that's, if that's the path you wanna to go to. I mean, to be honest with you, um, I did a call guru for the Scuddy specialty, and it was literally the only exam I've ever failed. And then I went back, at that point, Adrian was at Linux Academy, and I went through his stuff, which was twice as long and covered enough things. That's, it's, it's, that's the problem with like an ACOW guru or honestly a Udemy or any of those places. They're not going to go to the depth. They're not going to go to the kinds of questions. None of these things is giving you is, is, is a brain dump. None of these things are giving you the questions. It's just someone making up sample questions that are specific to the areas. The other thing to realize and I could go on quite a bit on this. The other thing to realize is when you answer a question, even if maybe English isn't the first primary language of the person who wrote the question, so you get it wrong because you, the grammar was messed up and it was messing up with your head and you couldn't quite understand what you're supposed to do. If you go to a question, someone told me this in a, a boot camp for a CISSP boot camp. In that case, it was imagine if you were um, a security manager and answer these questions like a security manager, not a security engineer. So when you go into these questions, everybody here that's bo bothering to take these tests is going to ha actually do this as a job and answer the question like you would in real life. Don't try to overthink it. Don't try to think it's a trick question. Answer it, unless it's something really dumb like, What's the default length for messages and SMS or something like that? Or, and they used to be those, there's a lot less, it's mostly scenario stuff now. So they usually, they want you to know if you understand it, not if you can remember a bunch of stupid little numbers. So it's less about that. But since it's that understand it thing, answer it like you would in real life. In other words, they, they give you three choices of kind of technologies you could use. What would you actually do? Would you really put that thing in elastic beanstalk at this day and age? No, don't, so don't answer the question like that. Answer it like you would for real. And that will probably give you more success than trying to outthink the person who's trying to write the question to try to test if you know something. Does that make sense? And, and that, that's helped me quite a bit too. And then there's the stupid stuff like, don't be tired, like that exam I failed. I moved my daughter back from college and only had four hours of sleep before taking the train down to Chicago. And so my, my mental resources probably weren't at the top, in addition to the fact I didn't have Adrian, if that makes sense. More questions? Yes? Well, the, the AWS exams, are very generous that way in that it's three years. Uh, and like I said, the, the earlier ones, you don't have to renew the associate ones and the practitioner. So there's four you don't have to renew. So it's not so bad. If, if, if all you wanted to do is just get the pros, get up to the pros and say you're done, it's two exams every three years. So that's pretty painless. It's when you get into the specialty exams of which I have almost all of them. Um, those can be uh, painful because they'll come up and you'll be, honestly, uh, when you look at that, I'm basically studying for a renewal all the time. That makes sense. Um, more questions? Well, if there's no more questions, I, I strongly encourage you, I can't even begin to explain, except, except here, I, I wanna, wanna show, show you some. some. I, just I just wanna, wanna show, show you the slide. slide. If, if you, you look at these slides here, here like, like what, what about, about beta exams? You'll, it's small, but in the notes for all these slides that you'll have available to you, there's a ton of information and experience that I'm trying to cut short because I was kind of running, running, running behind, behind here. here. So, so I, I would encourage you, if you look, look at any, or my, my, my favorite here, here 
you know, my, my last parting gift, gift here. here. Uh, these are the quick takeaways. These are the answers to the five things. Uh, you know, certification provides conceptual framework and helps keeping up with technology. Crash courses were available in tutorial JoJo's is what you want to use. And, uh, and even that recommendation will change over time as things happen. And it also varies with cloud vendors. If, we, if you want to have a discussion about how to study for Microsoft, I'll have the concepts are the same, but I'll have different resources that you need to use. And you're so close, you can actually read that. I, I do apologize that. Avoid stale study material. When practical, in-person is better for taking the exam. Pace yourself, don't get hung up. Choose an answer and keep going. Practice sex, make good study guides. Take, taking beta exams is probably not worth the extra hassle. So that, that, that's, that's, the, that's the takeaways. Thanks guys for... Uh, uh, good afternoon. I'm Pat Davies from Direct Supply in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and today I'm talking about maximizing performance and savings with AWS uh, Compute Optimizer. Just a quick introduction. Uh, I joined Direct Supply in 2010. I became a platform engineer in 2018 working with AWS. Direct Supply provides products and technology solutions for the senior care market. Uh, everybody is probably on a cost uh, optimizing journey. Hopefully you are. Today I'm focusing on the right sizing portion. Uh, but first, shout out to your discounts. There's no engineering effort here, no architecture. Reservation savings plans, just really easy things that you should do. And of course, deleting things you don't use and suspending, suspending things that shouldn't be running all night. So back to right sizing. Uh, it's configuring or reconfiguring your resources to maximize the savings while still meeting your performance goals. So we want to downsize resources uh, without compromising performance, increase or modify other resources to meet performance goals. So we're basically maximizing your AWS spend. Uh, re so resource optimization is both cost and performance. Uh, challenges of right sizing. Uh, it's typically the data and the analysis of that data takes engineering effort, and sometimes there's a lot of it. It also can be error prone. The other thing is that uh, a lot of new services are continually coming out with from AWS. There's new EC2 instance sizes, uh, and you may not be aware of them or how they could help your savings or performance situation. Uh, so wouldn't it be nice if there was something to help? AWS Compute Optimizer launched in 2019. It's a machine learning AWS service that uses your existing CloudWatch data metrics to, uh, def to find over-provisioned and under-provisioned EC2, EBS volumes, network, Lambda functions, and ECS Fargate resources. Uh, not only that, it makes recommendations on how to improve, either meet your performance goals or save, uh, save some money. Where is it? Like every other uh, feature, pretty much it's got its own dashboard. It's also integrated with uh, Cost Explorer. It's on the left-hand side, circle there, right-sizing recommendations. Also, the cost optimizer recommendations can be found right at the instance uh, level. For a couple of years, I've been seeing this little uh, under-provisioned, over-provisioned, don't care, I got to fix a security group but it's worth taking a click to see if your uh, instance can be uh, perhaps reduced to save some, some money. Uh, viewing and accessing recommendations from the dashboard, uh, you can uh, list by type, by region. Uh, in this case, I've identified a tag to bring up an instance and it says it's under provisioned in this case. And then if you could scroll over, you could see some other things, including recommendations. Um, and then once you, you look, you drill down into that, and at the top, that's your current situation, what you're running. And then AWS typically gives you three options of what you can do uh, in this case to help meet our, our, our performance metrics or goals. Uh, so it's saying, hey, it's a T2 micro, you'd be better off with a T3 micro or a T2, T2, T2 small. And then also at the bottom, it'll show you 
metrics that you're currently at and metrics that it believes will be in play when you make the actual adjustment. So in, in here, the blue and the green line are kind of munged together, but uh, it, the expectation there is it's not gonna be uh, much of a difference performance wise, or it's, I'm sorry, it's going to, it's gonna get, meet your perform, performance goals. So then I get that flip around. Uh, the, the other way of viewing uh, recommendations in the AWS Compute Optimizer console, you can export utilization data and recommendations to a, to a CSV file to an S3 bucket. So you can select different regions, the different resource types, and select all sorts of different columns, uh, utilization recommendations. I just check them all and let it rip. And the resulting CSV file is giant, hundreds or thousands of rows, uh, 50 plus columns, uh, and the account ID is in scientific notation, so that's fun. Um, so now what? Well, like anybody else wants to see something more uh, pleasant, so I did just pretty it up a little bit so I can see a little bit better what, uh, what I'm dealing with. Flavor it to taste. Uh, we had a question uh, that we were hoping that AWS Cost Optimizer could help us with. It ended up being more of an inventory situation, but this is what we did. Uh, we suspected the Windows instances with two CPUs or uh, two gigabytes of memory were a bottleneck during our patching process. And we wanted to identify those and see how much it would cost to get those upgraded to something with more memory and more CPU. So, uh, just using some standard Excel tools, uh, we were able to create some tables with costs and different uh, EC2 types and uh, figure out what's the next class up where we could get both that memory and the, and the CPU. Because you know that uh, EC2 sizes being t-shirt sizes, you can't spin up a C4 large with two gigabytes of memory and you can't spin up a 2T micro with 16 gigabytes of memory. So, the punchline from all that data munging around in Excel was if we were going to upgrade all of our machines with, to the CPU and uh, memory targets, it was gonna be $14,000 more or 85% increase. Now, that doesn't sound uh, like a good idea. So then we, I, I did some more in the Excel spreadsheet and found out what, what can we do if we just do the memory upgrades? Uh, and in that case, it was about $3,000 more uh, so this is just an example of what you can do with all that inventory information uh, in, in that Excel spreadsheet, uh, in addition to uh, uh, recommendation options that AWS will give you. Um, and there's also Compute Optimizer for Lambda functions. It finds which ones are CPU intensive and which ones are memory intensive. A Lambda function that is CPU intensive with over-provisioned memory, you should just reduce the memory. It just saves cost and, cost and it won't adversely affect your performance. Uh, a CPU intensive Lambda, Lambda can have a recommendation to increase memory, which increases cost, but then the Lambda runs in a shorter amount of time and it can tend to be a wash as far as, uh, you, and you get something that performs better for about the same amount of money. Uh, the Compute Optimizer for EC2 components, touched on some of these already, uh, CPU memory with monitoring enabled, um, network performance, bytes, packets, in outs per second, storage throughput, IO, IOPS, and, uh, attached EBSs and SSD, and also auto scaling groups. So in uh, some tips for uh, Compute Optimizer, you have to enable it in your console. Uh, it uses the last 14 days of data and that's free. You can expand that to three months, but there's uh, a cost that is incurred. Uh, memory metric, like I mentioned, is not available by default. You need the CloudWatch agent. Other sources uh, supported Datadog, Dynatrace, Instana, Insta and New Relic. Uh, you should implement tagging standards for any number of reasons, but this is just another one. So you can understand who you have to contact when you're gonna do some optimizing work because they, they may wanna know what you're up to. Uh, recommendations are refreshed daily. So keep coming back, make changes and see, if, see, see how it gets affected. Uh, the analysis is you know, smarter than just looking at the average. If you have uh, something that's very busy during the day and dormant at night, it's not just gonna give you the average. It takes those things into account. Uh, it's also actively developed. There's new features from it coming out regularly and there's a link to that. 
Uh, thanks for joining. Hope I got enough lightning in there to get out in 10 minutes or less. And I'm going to talk about solving the uh, DynamoDB event bridge pipes problem. My name is Jason Wadsworth. I am the Chief Architect and Trust Department at Armonino, which is an, occult, uh, an accounting firm. Don't ask me how I started an accounting firm because I really can't answer that. I'm really a startups guy. But So what are event bridge pipes? Uh, event bridge pipes are a way to connect two services within AWS that don't kind of have a natural connection. An example of this is DynamoDB Streams and event bridge events, which was perfect because I actually had a use case for that. We uh, normally will send out events, like if a user was created, updated, deleted, we'll send an event uh, via event bridge. And actually the way we did this uh, before all this was we had a Lambda function that read off DynamoDB stream, uh, formatted a message and sent it via event bridge. <clears throat> so event bridge pipes, in theory, should remove that. And I'm like, great, opportunity to, to change something. So this is the data that I'm saving. As you can tell, it looks a little bit different between what I'm saving to DynamoDB and what I want to send to EventBridge. We use the single table pattern in DynamoDB. If you're not familiar with it, check it out. Uh, Alex Debris, Debris has some great stuff on it, um, but the PK and SK partition key and sort key. So as you can see, the PK has my ID in it. SK is just an indicator of the type of record it is. And then notice groups there is an array of strings. Seem pretty straightforward. Uh, we can do some basic mapping from, from the source into the destination and it wouldn't be a big deal. But uh, turns out DynamoDB actually stores things a little bit differently. This is actually what that record looks like in DynamoDB. And again, it wasn't that big of a deal because it's just like adding .s to most things if you're thinking JSON path, but the last one's where it gets interesting, groups. Um, it doesn't store it as an array of strings, it stores it as an L object with an array of objects with an S object that is a string. Now, I'm not exactly a JSON path guru, but I played around with a little bit and I came up with this and this should work, right? So in theory, uh, it takes a star out of the L and grabs all the strings and this JSON path seemed like it was gonna work. This is what the structure is for uh, formatting this for the, the destination to, to do some uh, transform, but it didn't work. It took me a little while to figure out exactly what the problem was. It turned it out that it didn't like that uh, L star thing there at all. And so I, after playing around with it a little bit, I just kind of gave up on it. Um, I didn't need groups right away. So I'm like, you know what? I'll punt that, do that later, <clears throat> come back to it. Somebody else will solve that. So it turned out not long after that, somebody uh, in the AWS community builder program uh, put a message in the Slack channel and was like, hey, I have this problem. It's exactly what I'm doing here. Like exactly the only difference is they called it roles, I called it groups, everything else is identical. So I'm like, okay, great. I'm gonna join that Slack channel or that Slack message and see what's going on. Somebody's gonna solve this problem. I'm gonna implement that solution, fantastic. Um, nobody implemented the solution. So I'm like, okay, well, let me see if I can figure this out. So I took a stab at it and came up with this. And this actually ended up working. So inside of EventBridge, uh, EventBridge pipes, you can actually add what they call an enrichment step. And an enrichment step just kind of stands in the middle. And so you can call different things. Uh, you can call a Lambda function. Uh, I'm going to call an AWS step function. <clears throat> and uh, it just takes the input from, from the source side and then takes the output and sends it to the destination. Great, simple solution. This is what my, <clears throat> my step function looks like. As you can see, it's not really very complicated. Uh, it has a map state because they're passing an array. Inside that, I just do a pass state. And that pass state has uh, basically the same uh, JSON path that I mentioned uh, or showed you before. Of course, it's formatted differently because every uh, it seems like everybody in AWS has to make sure that you're well aware of the fact that they work on two pieces of teams and never talk to each other. So it's a little bit different, but basically the same. <clears throat> so I actually produced a blog post for that. Everything's great. Um, I'm happy. And not long after that, I get an email from AWS from their, their product manager on EventBridge Pipes. And he's like, hey, saw your blog post. We fixed it. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, they sent me a message about uh, my blog post. They noticed that they fixed the problem. I put a little asterisk next to it because um, it wasn't quite right initially, but they worked on a little bit. We got there. So happy things are working well. <clears throat> um, I've got my solution in place. And, um, but then I'm talking to AWS about this uh, through that conversation. And I'm like, is this actually really okay? Should I be doing it this way? Uh, so best practices inside DynamoDB streams say that you should have no more than two consumers on any individual stream. Well, um, because I'm sending both, uh, I'm sending a created event, a deleted event, an updated event. And by the way, I'm using a single table pattern, which means that I have multiple objects that I could be sending out of the same table. I have a lot more than two streams. 
<clears throat> so I stepped back a little bit and I thought, okay, well, how can I solve this in a way that still allows me to use event bridge pipes, don't have to write code, uh, can still do this, but not have, have um, the multiple streams on it. So um, I stepped back a little bit and like came up with a solution. And basically I removed uh, a step and I, I went directly from event bridge, uh, or DynamoDB streams through pipes directly to step functions, which is, which is a valid destination. And uh, I was a lot, able to basically send all my messages there, right? I do some basic filtering things that I don't want to send uh, messages for, but all of them are all in the same step function. And the step function ends up looking a little bit like this. It's a bit more complicated. Um, and actually ends up being more complicated if you have different types in there. But the idea is inside that same uh, uh, map function, again, getting one, one uh, record for each one of the records that are coming through the stream, the first thing I do is a simple choice state and figure out, is this an insert? Is this an update? Is this a delete? Uh, create a slightly separate message based on each one of those. And then I actually am using the SDK integration within step functions to call my event bridge uh, event <clears throat> because it actually has a really great uh, integration there that allows me to kind of format the message a little bit better. I could have just taken this output and sent it directly to event bridge, still done this as an enrichment step. This actually ended up being a little cleaner. So that's where my uh, solution ended up and that's really about all I have. Thank you very much. I'm Jeremy Reiner. Um, briefly said this earlier, I've been in the IT industry for almost 25 years now. Actually, it's 26. I'm dating myself a little bit. The gray beard shows it off anyway, so it's fine. I started out as a sysadmin, like a lot of us back in the double aughts and 99, right? Quickly turned into a developer. Now, funny part is, is I actually started as a music education major in college. Frankly, I just wanted to change the world by bringing better arts to the, to the children in the world. I wanted to teach high school orchestra. That was my dream. Found out I couldn't make any money at it, got into IT. Common story in IT. But that core of wanting to change the world, and not in big ways, right? I'm not gonna solve world hunger. We're not gonna create world peace. Frankly, I'm not gonna find the best way to get clean drinking water to everybody in the world. But I knew I could make small changes everywhere I went. And that's what we do in IT. It's what we do best, in fact. We make small changes, incremental changes, day after day, week after week, year after year, to create something huge that never goes away. Now, for the last 10 years, I've been working in consulting firms, small, medium ones, helping them get better aligned with partners like AWS and Azure and find ways to deliver better for our customers and help do it more effectively. And that doesn't just mean delivering better code, but doing it at a better cost basis. Because frankly, consultants are way too expensive for the companies that hire them. So we take a lot of different ways to do that. At modernization, Biggest buzzword in the world, something we've been doing since the, the double aughts as well. It's really just custom app development with a slightly different approach. Now, I'm gonna start this story a little bit differently because this happened in a, in a time where nothing was really happening in consulting and IT unless you were trying to get remote workers enabled. Because in 2020, March of 2020, one of my old contacts, traditional CEO that jumped co between companies every five years or so, gave me a call and said, hey, I'm taking a new job. There's this company called Vine. They make a product that's really cool. It's called Trace. It does all these communications managements for solutions for big healthcare groups and hospital groups. So you think of the Northwestern uh, Hospital Group, right? Locations all over the place. CHS literally has hospitals everywhere. They use this kind of product to make it so that they can get better communication to their patients, manage authorization processes through Medicare and Medicaid, insurance, take all the communications that come in from various sources, put it in one place, track it, log it, manage it, and communicate with it, right? 
they've got a product that they've been building for almost 20 years dedicated to this. She goes, I'm going into this new company and I need two things. First is I promised the board we would be cloud native at the end of next year. Great, we can help you with that. I run a cloud consultancy, not a problem. Two, we need to bring our operating costs down because it costs us way too much to run these platforms. It's about a dozen servers that get installed on-prem at the hospitals. It's a pain in the butt, just way too expensive. All right, we can probably do something there, at least in the roadmap, get you to a point where we can consolidate, make it more effective. And three, I need to get onboarding done faster. Right now, from the day a new, a new hospital signs on with us to the day they can start using our product is about six months which I had this look, right? My eyes are wide. I'm like, how does it take six months to get something implemented? Now, don't get me wrong, compliance, security, architect review, that can take time. That's not included in that six month time frame she gave me. That's from the moment their technologists get the approval to start installing things to the moment that people can start using it. We had to make that better. So not a problem. I'm gonna get a whole bunch of my smart guys in the room with your really smart guys. We're gonna figure out your product, understand it a little bit better, get the scope of this thing. We'll get you a plan put together. Sat down with them and over three days, eight hours each, we went through everything from the architecture to a demoed install to the way that people use it. They, my guys, bless them, recorded every session, had all of the intent to go back to the office and start tearing into this thing, putting together proposals, figuring out how to deliver it faster. <laughs> and I, at the end of the third day, I, I looked at the CEO and I just went, you know, this isn't going to happen as fast as you want. And frankly, you're going to end up spending $10 million and I can't even promise an outcome if we do anything with this product. It's too complex. There's too many servers in it. There's way too many integrations that are built on old C++ code to even try to do anything on this. We need to look at your application and find a better way of delivering it. She goes, I was afraid you were going to say that. And then I said, looked at her and I'm like, you know what? The one thing I realized, I forgot to ask you a very important question before we got all of your people in the room and all of my guys in the room. Why are we doing this? Yes, we have three outcomes we want to hit. We need to move it to the cloud. Great. Why do you want to move to the cloud? We need to make it less complex so that it's easier to install, faster to manage, easier to get out from after the contract. But why? There's a cost basis to that. But how does it serve your customers to do that? That got us into the right conversations. The real goal and what she promised the board, we need to go after the mid-market doctor's offices, the clinics and the clinician groups. They don't need this huge product that does all this stuff with an EHR implementation. They're looking for something more simple. They're looking for better engagement with their patients. This concept in healthcare, patient centricity has been around forever. But delivering on it was what she really wanted to promise. And they wanted to do that for every doctor's office in America. And they wanted to do it in the next three months. So what was important out of this old solution that they had built was the communication management, authorizations management, and denials management. Those are the three biggest things that can help a doctor's office perform more effectively and, uh, and really get in with their patients and start delivering better care. So we went back to the drawing board. If we just take those three pieces, communications management, denials management, and authorization management, can we build a product in three months in the cloud that's cost-effective, consumption modeled, and a pricing model that they can sell to new, new customers? This is how I, we, we pitched it and what we usually do. And 
mind you, if you're working with a consulting firm and they don't have something like this, or if you work at a consulting firm, you don't have something like this, please steal it. I tell every consulting firm I work with and I consult for, having some sort of no cost basis to go in and understand the business drivers first and the objectives that you're going after before you start building is critical. I love agile frameworks. We deliver on them all the time. That is how my teams operate. Without that first section, understanding the business and technology review, none of it will be successful because you're always building to something you're of an unknown. Making sense so far? I'll pause there. Yeah, we got some thumbs up. I like it. The big piece here, making sure that you understand those objectives. And I failed on that, mind you, right? At least I caught myself before we started putting hands on keyboard. But understanding it and then building toward it is kind of the key. And that's exactly what these guys did. So over a series of 14 weeks, we took all of that old code and old process management, communications management solutions that were built into that monolithic product and peeled them away. Took them out, refactored them, brand new .NET Core. Mind you, the guys did everything they could to make sure that this thing was modeled as future-proof as possible, which we know is impossible. They tried, but it's built on Lambdas, S3, basic step functions. And frankly, they did a fantastic job at it because there's not much to the architecture itself. API gateways, basic security, and everything built very simply in as cloud native technology basis as possible. Interesting part though is in those 14 weeks, they were doing a showcase every two weeks. That product was being shown off and they had that first interface available already in the second week that we started working. Imagine that. Those conversations with the CEO occurred over about three weeks from the day she called me to the day we finally got to a point where I had an approach in front of her and said, we can deliver this and this is what's gonna cost you. Mind you, I will give you that punchline so that you understand what a product development should cost you. But it was three weeks from start to finish there. And then from the day that she signed the contract, 14 weeks later, she had a working MVP, minimum viable product. Mind you, not production ready necessarily, basically scalable because it's in Lambdas and S3, right? You've got the basic redundancy built into everything, but it hasn't been pressure tested by users, basic unit testing's already built in, et cetera. But it's an MVP. You don't go full featured on everything. Built that product in 14 weeks. Punchline is they monetized it in the 16th week. Two brand new clients and customers. Those mid-market doctor's offices and clinician groups signed up 16 clinician groups or 16 doctor's offices in a clinician group. That's huge. A new revenue stream based off of one project. Beyond that, we started creating add-ons. They realized that this is the application modernization story that they wanted to approach. Take the old functions and features of trace, recreate them by taking that code out of it, and building it on this new platform that was already integrated with identity management, global identity management, in this case through Okta and Ping Identity, already secured and in, uh, built out with compliance regulations. Very simple stuff to do with AWS. I'm not going to preach on that. I think there's two sessions happening today talking about it anyway. And very easily scalable because all we're doing is building additional lambdas and making sure the API gateway itself can handle it all. So adding new features in is nothing more than building out the data constructs. And in this case, DynamoDB and RDS, again, dead simple to make sure that we manage as long as the data architects doing their job and making sure you have the model right, right? But as they build on these more, more of these add-ons, they found out that automation of all this was the hardest part for them. Some of their new clients that they were signing on had some regulatory requirements, let's call them, which basically said, we don't wanna be shared in a shared environment with any of the other clients, which as an ISV, 
not the thing you want to hear necessarily, but you know it's going to happen with some of your special clients. So how do we automate replicating this without having to rebuild it all every time? Built it out really simply. All it is lambdas and code deployment. So code pipeline took care of it for you. They just had to have another account set up for it, dedicated to the client. The interesting part was when they started getting into the one piece that they didn't want to touch originally. For those of you that know the healthcare business, EHRs, electrical health record systems, just say they're hard to deal with. They have their own little ecosystem of how you connect with them, how do you interact with them, and how you integrate with them. The most popular of these groups is probably Epic, and they are notoriously hard to work with. Building that integration took most of the beginning of this year. We finally finished it. It's done. We're moving on to something else. Um, but those integrations are going to enable that migration from that traditional monolith of trace to getting into a cloud native platform. As more and more of our ISVs and our big providers out there are starting to host their, thing, their products in the cloud, all of these health tech innovators, fintech innovators, the technology innovators of the world are going to have to follow suit or we won't be able to keep up. Vine's now at that point and they're starting to do that, start that process. I was making sure because I thought I only had four slides in this. As you can tell, I keep my presentations nice and sweet and short. Is this pretty good so far? Good content? Decent story for you? All right. I'm going to go back to one point for you then real quick before I close out and start getting into Q&A a little bit for this one. This guy. Worked for, let's call it four different consulting gr groups now in the last 10 years. My entire career has been about change, right? Kind of started that. In the last 10 years, because I've had so many different groups that I've worked with, I've tried to create a different way that consulting groups engage and partners engage with clients. And this revolves entirely around how AWS likes to work customer centric with you. We cannot as consultants be conser good conservators of a relationship asking everybody to pay for advisory. Let's just say I, I've had a lot of executive arguments with different consulting groups and PE firms, for that matter, about this point. Business advisory, sure. McKinsey's out there, they're gonna stay forever. Don't worry about it. Business advisory will always be there to help you. Technical advisory should be part of your contract and part of your, your process, not something that stands alone. Anytime you think you need advisory services, what you're really missing is somebody asking that one question right up front. Why are we doing this? And what do we want to get out of it? Focus on that and everything else will fall into place. All right, enough of me on the soapbox. From a broader story standpoint, how does this resonate with you guys? Who's been in the same position so far? I'll take some hands trying to build something new. Questions about how to go about it, getting buy-in from the board even. I'll tell you that those conversations are usually more about your presentation than they are about the content. As you can tell, I've got a fantastic marketing team that loves to work on great graphics. They make me look good. I advise you get, get somebody on the marketing team to help you out if you ever need to sell a project upwards. Yeah, absolutely. So 
Refine as a platform is first and foremost, a typical SaaS platform, multi-tenancy. So you get all the same things that you would get anywhere else, right? Identity management, a good data platform, in this case, Dynamo and RDS. Um, identity management, frankly, we just used AWS identity and then uh, implemented with ping identity as well as with Okta to handle consumer grade identities when they needed it, right? You need to have options when it comes down to that stuff. Otherwise, partners aren't going to work with you building, right? Once you have that, the biggest thing the architects worked out was the API integrations. What is our API architecture going to look like? What's public? What's private? And how are we going to manage those connections? Because that's going to define our, our entitlement process. So when people subscribe to the solution, we need to make sure we can be able to provide the keys to access the data they need and only the data they, they're supposed to get. So once we had the APIs done, entitlements came. From there, you have a SaaS solution. Then it's function and feature development. Those function and features are whatever you need to build. In this case, a focus on a, a really not a sexy project in this case, which is part of the reason I kind of fluffed over it. Um, it was just authorization management for Medicare and Medicaid. That was the MVP. As long as we had that in, that helped the doctor's offices go from weeks to getting authorization to treat a patient to hours, which anybody in healthcare, right? <laughs> That's huge. If we can get past the paperwork part of it, which mind you, Medicare and Medicaid up until this point, ESMD was the new thing that made it so that we could actually integrate with an API with the government. Huge, because up until then it was faxing, actual faxing. To this day, people are still faxing to get authorization for Medicare and Medicaid. So getting that in place, was the big thing. That's what we sold those first two clients on. Beyond that, it was denials management. Denials management is one of the heaviest communication management pieces in any healthcare system that you're going to get into. You send in this pre-authorization process, they say no. They tell you they need six more things. You send them six more things, they say you sent the wrong ones, even though they're exactly what you told them they, they told you you needed. You send them more. That communication management and managing that log of, of trail, because all of that is HIPAA compliant documentation, having it in a secure solution was our second piece. So from a technology perspective, really basic. Lambdas, APIs, and some very basic stuff that we put the interface through static pages on a S3 bucket that were provided up through Lambdas. Simple as that, right? Your kind of typical, how do we make a very thin cloud native application solution or a SaaS application? That pattern's well documented, well known at this point. It's building the features and functions that's the hardest part and making them scalable. Um, as a note, right now, we're actually about to roll off that client. We're finishing up unit test coverage. Mid-year last year, June, we had 0% coverage on unit testing. Well, documented. There was some unit testing, but 0% documented unit test. In November, we had 92%. As of today, we're at 98. That's insanity. Going from that, typically when you take a product like this, it's like a year and a half of trying to get that coverage done. I love my team. <laughs> Bragging for them a little bit for that. That answer your question pretty well? Identity management, lambdas, S3, some step functions for managing more branching functions. Um, we do have two EC2 processes running out there, but they're really just the lambda functions that tended to run too long. So it was easier to run them in queue out of SQS and SNS out of an EC2 bucket than it is to run them on a lambda. Less expensive that way. Kind of. So this, it, it was not running on AWS. So before this, they didn't have anything in AWS. I'll go back a little bit on the slides here for you. So this trace product is a series of six to 20 servers that's installed at the hospital or healthcare group 
in their data center right next to the EHR because it requires low latency between them right now. And it's required to be installed there. So yes, it was installed on-prem. No, we could not translate it directly. <laughs> um, the original ask of migrating this product directly to AWS Let's just say it was unfeasible. It, it, there, we could have done it. It just wouldn't have helped anybody. It would have helped my revenue line. That's about it. <laughs> yeah. You're getting into one of my favorite conversations. All right. Yeah. How many consultants do I have in the room real quick? A eh, decent group. Okay. I'm not going to go into my full diatribe on this, but I will happily sit down with you and talk about this later on to you. Basically, the question is fixed fee versus time and materials and how you estimate that and ensure that you don't have overrun in your projects. And I'm only going to take a minute on this to make sure anybody else has any questions we can go into. It all comes down to your architects. Um, when it comes down to it, fixed fee puts the onus of risk on you and your consulting group. Time and materials puts the onus on the client defining good outcomes and ensuring that they have solid deliverables in there that you're promising to deliver in the time and materials that you're providing is cost. That's really what you're talking about. It all comes down to how you're estimating and how you're calculating that margin. This is one of the hardest things for small consulting firms to do. And part of the reason why you see folks like CDW and Accenture charge five to $600 an hour for their consultants is because they have to to cover all the back office that does all the calculation for you. Definitely sit down though. Um, grab my contact info if, at the very least and I can help you out with some of that. I, we just got acquired in a year ago, December, my last firm right now. They were a fixed fee firm. We were a time and materials firm. I've been having those conversations nonstop for the last 12 months. <laughs> Please. What I would tell you is if you're not walking alongside your client, you're leading them by the nose, which never works out for anybody. So having a partnership with your clients is of the utmost critical nature because when it, when it comes down to it, especially with new logos that you're engaging with, this is your time to build personal rapport that translates to your organizational rapport. And without getting that, you're never gonna get the second project. And we all know that common statement in consulting, your best future clients are your current clients. So having that partnership with them and letting them tell you everything they need, but then setting good expectations and boundaries based on that is what it's all about. And that's the estimating process and it's by large setting expectations and boundaries. Frankly, if any of you are married, that's really good advice for your marriage too. Oh, come on, only one chuckle? God, they two, okay, there we go. <laughs> Anyone else? Like I said. The monolith? Oh, no, 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 no. Migrating that monolith is the, the expectation we set to the board. That monolith will never migrate directly to a cloud. Um, the architecture of it, the complexity of it would mean that it is a lift and shift migration, which means it would cost three times as much to run as it does right now to make it so that the hospitals have to run it. So it would cost Vine more money. Their contract cost would triple at minimal. 
just to make it so that their clients could run it from the AWS or something like that. Now, don't get me wrong. AWS would love to see it. I wouldn't mind running those projects. They're really easy to do. Run something like any of the cloud migrators. I still try to say it's TSO, but I know it's not. But, you know, Migration Evaluator can move the whole thing over and we could set up the networking in probably a three-week period without any problem. But it really wouldn't be a good solution. Not yet, because it doesn't have all the features. So one of the big things that this has got is a lot of image analysis, document repository management, and solutions made for faxing and uh, audio recording from their call centers. So those are pieces that are still in the roadmap. In fact, we have all the cards and epics built out at this point. You're talking about a three to five year project deal to finish that out. Ideally, we're not going to be involved in that anymore. We've built the basis for it. We built the SaaS application. We got them monetized. And we've started transitioning everything over to their internal development teams to trans transition from developing Trace to developing Refine. That's our goal, my goal. Again, love making changes in the world. So even if I can make those little small changes and change somebody's direction a little bit, that's huge for me. All right, we are at time, which means I'm going to get kicked off the stage because somebody else to get, has to get on. I appreciate everybody. If you do want to get in contact with me, um, greiner at converge1.com, and I will find my clicker again, which I already tossed in my pocket. Um, likewise, you can find me- Formal, very rigid talk. Uh, just kidding. Up until right now, our panel is fluid. I'll let you introduce yourselves and our wonderful moderator you've heard from today. Hi, I'm Ashley Macko. I'm the VP of Operations at the FinOps Foundation. Um, the FinOps Foundation is part of the Linux Foundation, so you're all probably familiar with CNCF. Um, we are one of their projects, and I just volunteered to moderate, so we'll see what questions I can come up with on the fly. Okay. Oh, hi, I'm Angela Mandato. I'm an entrepreneur and software developer, previously also CIO. I am Dave Stoffaker. I am an AWS hero, and... Uh, I work at Direct Supply up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And oh, is this on? Oh, and I am Caitlin Kariakis, uh, Senior Cloud Finance Manager here at Morningstar. I've uh, been with Morningstar for about seven and a half years now um, in this role for five years and um, had an accounting background, did not have a tech background. So now here I am. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll start. One of the things that I try to debunk is like a lot of people think that FinOps is just cost optimization. So what would you guys say to that? Well, I'll, I'll take a, a first whack. Um, FinOps is a combination of like architecture, the software architecture, as well as the costs involved and everything that runs in it. At least that's how I view it. Go ahead. I was just saying, I think the, the platform and the software that you're running really informs the, the amount you're spending in the cloud too. If you have a really inefficient database call that's, your, you know, or web page that just your splash page takes 80 database calls that mean nothing to happen, you're sizing up for a much greater need than you actually have. So in the end, FinOps is tied to a cost reduction or cost optimization or knowing that you're running at the right appropriate level of spend, but it's also that, that engineering layer to uncover those inefficiencies at the technology stack that help drive improved cost management. I think kind of piggybacking on what you both said, um, the efficiency piece is what I try to drive home. I feel like a lot of times you hear in ops cost optimization, there's a stigma around it that it's cost cutting, you know, um, and it's really about, you know, making sure that, there's this myth, I feel like early on that most people thought that things were just cheaper in the cloud and it's not necessarily the truth. It's that you have to architect to be cheaper in the cloud. So it's making sure that we're um, taking, advantages, taking advantage of those efficiencies that are out there. The other thing we talk about a lot of the FinOps framework is different personas. So I'm kind of curious for you all, like what are all the personas that are involved in a FinOps, like FinOps practice? And then given that you had a background in being a CIO um, before, like what, what, do you, what would you want out of a FinOps practice to help you navigate? making decisions? Um, well, first you need someone to be a constant learner. Uh, so um, if anybody that's in the FinOps position in your company, you want them to be able to keep track of trends and what's happening and knowledge that they should start, you know, being more exposed to. 
uh, and also send them to as many conferences related to FinOps as possible. Um, just the one I attended in, in April, I found out that it seems simple, but just enable encryption even between your servers and, and servlets or whatever inside your um, availability zone will save money just because it'll save that little bandwidth between the, uh, the zones. You have a background in finance, right? You said, what, yes. what do you, what is the involvement in finance with FinOps these days? So that's been, um, I guess, a hotter topic at Morningstar nowadays. Um, so for a little background, we have cloud services team, which is dedicated to the adoption of public cloud at Morningstar. And I'm on there. Um, historically, I've been a one, I guess, woman show on the finance side of things. But as we've scaled, we've learned that's just not sustainable. And so in order to um, make that more sustainable, you know, we have over... 2000 technologists that are all um, active, we have really started to work on getting the finance um, personas, I guess, is um, from our standpoint, that is the financial analysts that sit in the corporate FP&A group that support all the business units of the teams um, where the products are being developed. So getting them more involved um, has been a really big uh, focus this year especially because they have the business knowledge, you know, of when we're trying to do forecasts with teams, I don't understand, you know, where their product roadmaps are, what that might look like, what their goals are, how new customers translates into, you know, what increase in spend might be from a public cloud standpoint. So um, I think the finance aspects, not necessarily me being the, practi the practitioner from, a finance, from the, you know, persona standpoint, having them being involved has been a really crucial, um, I guess, objective for us. And do you see, like, with engineers, do you see, like, them more progression in their career when they are taking into considerations what the things cost and cost savings? Do you think that's a, a bigger part of being, like, an engineer lead that people look for when they're, um, you know, uh, recruiting or promoting? So when we first started building at AWS, we took our first year of kind of that building the landing zone and learning the landscape and we, we did as much work as we could to standardize everything with Terraform. So any service you want to use has a Terraform module. And we went through and started to compute a cost and a run rate for each of those modules. So it was easier for an engineer to look and say, like, okay, if I aggregate this module and this module into my service, then, okay, I know this one's $4 an hour, this one's $3 an hour. So, okay, do the math, so on and so forth. Um, so that started kind of paving the path towards the cost conversation. Our challenge was that we never have done chargeback before. We didn't even do effective showback. We had best guess back, um, but that was about it. So, so we started at the same time developing a, a language within the culture of what that showback would look like and how much things really run when the businesses have to pay for the resources they're using versus it just comes out of the IT budget. So, so I think the engineering conversation really kicked up when it became showback. And then when chargeback hit, it was, it was definitely at the front of everyone's mind. Cause then the questions were, okay, why am I paying X amount for, you know, this service or why does it take 50 compute nodes to run this one, one portion of our, our platform? So and is everyone familiar with when he says charge back and uh, show back the difference? All right. Do you want to answer that one? <laughs> okay. Um, so, so show back is you run your financial reports and your cost breakdowns. We drive everything off of tagging on whatever service we're running in AWS. And then we run reports that say like, okay, anything tagged with application a let's come up with a cost. So anything tagged application a for the month of June cost X amount of dollars. And then we maybe break it down a little bit further than that if they want to see different components. Chargeback is, is an actual monetary transaction where in IT, we get the bill, we run the reports, and we say, okay, your portion of the total AWS bill for last month was X. And here's exactly the cost that you have to transfer into our account so we can pay the AWS bill. So when there's no language of, of communicating on budgets or what I call best guess back, like, hey, how much does it cost to run a search platform? Eh, I don't know, you know, maybe a few bucks. Um, then nobody cares. And when it's just show back, they're like, ooh, that's expensive, but I don't have a like 
there's not a burning reason that I'm responsible for making that better. But then when a chargeback hits, um, anyone who's accountable to hitting a budget line item is is doing their best to make sure they're managing to budget. So, yeah, that's a good example. And the other principle we talk a lot about in FinOps is like there are things that need to be pushed to the edge. So the engineers need to be accountable for and doing. And then there's things that get centralized, like buying commitments and, you know, doing an EDP. Um, love to hear you guys' take on like, what are some of those things that you absolutely think should be always pushed to the edge? And why would you centralize some activities? I'll go. Uh, we have a FinOps team of, of, of one full-time person and his job is all of that. He negotiates the, the contracts. He negotiates the, you know, what used to be reserved instances, now savings plans. He looks at all of the data in our AWS account and he's a, a rock star at it. And he finds all of those ways that we could save money. So before he reaches out to the line of business and says, hey, you're running a little hot on S3 or whatever, he's already done his best to drive that to the best possible cost. So I look at him as the negotiator and then we come in behind him to clean up any debris left after negotiation. Um, so there's not a whole lot that gets pushed directly to the engineers in our case, um, cause he is so good at covering all of the ground for us. Um, but that's said, we do several times a year, get pulled together. A few of us as kind of a, Hey, we're going to take on a pet project this sprint, um, or do it under the guise of a hackathon. He'll say like, Oh, I found a way to save like $75,000 a month. We got to do this. It looks pretty easy. And he'll pull a couple of us together for a couple of days and we'll, do our darndest to try and improve things. I always tell people if you don't have a FinOps person, like beg, borrow, and steal someone for a couple months to work on a project. So kind of the exact same thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, why might you want to centralize things like commitments? I'm just curious if you guys could chime in on why maybe that's not everybody, every engineer should go buy commitments. All right. So we have several different lines of business that all fall under one corporate umbrella. We are one company. We are one direct supply. And so if we had multiple people only looking out for their own territory. They may be trying to save money in ways that, okay, they save the money, but then they turn something off and they've still got this prepaid commitment that if we're centralizing it, we can absorb that in other areas of the business. And it's, it's kind of, we're covering all of our assets instead of somebody taking a different approach or, or, you know, over committing and under utilizing. Yeah. I'll say uh, previously I was at Pearson doing this, um, I knew maybe before most people things that we were going to sell off to. So you'd be like, Oh, well, we need to not buy a three-year commitment on this. Cause it's going to, you know, be gone another couple months. So there's certain strategic things that only key people are aware of too. And I think that's what plays into it. Um, can one of you all describe crawl, walk, run first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask what maybe crawl, walk, run would look like in a forecasting situation. I can take it. Um, so I know crawl, walk, run is, used commonly in FinOps to talk about the different stages of where you're at and your maturity of, you know, adopting FinOps. Um, as far as, you know, crawling and like the differences between um, those three stages, uh, you know, there's different buckets that you can be evaluated on. Um, you know, for example, if um, from a reporting standpoint, you know, crawling might be that um, you're ingesting the bill and you're showing that back you know, just as it is on the bill, maybe um, walking would be that you're putting it into, you know, some type of dashboard report on it and run might be, you know, you've adopted some more advanced mechanism of not even um, ingesting that data, putting it into a tagging scheme and actually being able to charge it back based on whatever your mechanisms are, having that all automated um, and spitting out monthly. Yeah, I think that's important. It's like with FinOps teams, they're doing all these BAU activities, business as usual things like buying reservations, dealing with the bill every month, right? And then they're trying to build these capabilities. So build better forecasting, build better reporting, um, build better automation. And so they're always kind of balancing what they have to get done every day and then like making things better for scale. Um, and that's what the crawl, walk, run comes in a lot. And we find some companies are like, I just want to walk at this one capability. Like I never want to do chargeback. We just want to keep everything central and we just want to, we'll always be, you know, walking at that, but we're going to be accelerating and show back. So um, next question I kind of have is uh, um, how does someone get started with FinOps? What would be kind of your advice for that? Well, I'll, I'll throw out this as, um, and we're talking about right, cr crawling first before you're walk or run in the in the process but um 
not to skip the that first one, but tagging is almost critical. And actually, I would almost say that as long as you tag everything within your different services, um, that gives you the capability to decide what do I put focus on and what is not costing us much anyway, so it's not worth the effort. Um, what was your advice on tagging strategy? Do you have any uh, tags you could throw out there like you're doing or how many? Just curious. Uh, I personally try to keep things simple. And actually, if things get real complicated, I'll rather have a separate AWS account and segregate services and features that way. And then the master account tags them by the account. But I'm curious to hear what you guys say. Um, I, know, I think keeping things simple. I know we kind of struggle with this because there are teams that want to kind of do their own thing and they have their own way of communicating. So they want to tag for this specific thing. But if we let everyone do that, I think we have maybe we'd have about 3000 different tags that, you know, so based on what teams have kind of gone, we obviously only enable, I think there's six total um, that we actually have that are live in the um, billing. But I will say tagging is a big one. That's, you know, looking back, there's things that I wish we had done better job of or, you know, enforced early on. That's certainly one of the areas because, you know, getting the technologist engineers in the mindset of actually doing that is hard to fix that behavior when you've gone so long without enforcing it. So, yeah. Um, I'll just put a plug in there for infrastructure as code. Um, when you start with infrastructure as code first, you can bake all of the tagging into it automatically. And people will follow the path of least resistance. So if they have to think about all these tags, they're never going to do it. If they have to do it manually, it's not going to happen. But if you have it built into everything they want to spin up so that it's tagged, and then also having some rules, <clears throat> excuse me, on the, on the backside that, okay, they deploy something without tags, well, that thing goes away. And they're emailed and said, ah, try tagging next time. You can keep your stuff. Um, I think that goes a long way towards kind of helping get that in there. Um, as far as things we care about for tagging, it's it's really which line of business is responsible for the spend. And maybe it's a corporate entity or it's one of our different revenue platforms. And then we care about things like who's the owner. Everything has to have an owner tag. And it can be a team email address. It doesn't have to be a person, but we care about having that owner defined. Um, and then our kind of golden three are application environment and role. So what application does it tie to? Um, is it dev? Is it QA? Is it production? And then the role it serves. Oh, this is the storage platform for the e-commerce site or, you know, this is reporting or whatever. Um, we keep a golden list of tags and then our FinOps guy gets a report on things that don't fit that list. And then he can do a little bit of, you know, investigative sleuthing to figure out which tags need updating. So it's awesome. Um, the switching gears a little bit. What type of other teams have you intersected within the organization? Like, have you had any things where FinOps and security intersect or FinOps and like a TBM organization, FinOps and uh, software asset management? What, is, what does that look like if you've had that experience? I think I can take that one. Um, definitely intersected with various areas. Um, security is definitely one. We have a um, internal um I'm blanking on the name right now, IT like service catalog um, that we're working with. I work with quite a bit to, you know, ingest a lot of the data. Um, the way that we have our account set up in AWS is based on teams. So, you know, ingesting some of that data and aligning it with our IT catalog along with our tagging. Um, off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember other, but we de there's definitely other areas that we intersect with and a lot more than you would think, you know, just, um, realizing how, you know, important it is that you're, you know, in communication with different parts of the business, um, different groups. Yeah, I always refer to it as like the FinOps hug. I feel like we're like the communication coach between some of these teams sometimes too. Yeah. yeah. Um, what is one challenge you're facing right now in, in the FinOps space? Like we talked about a lot about tagging, but like what's the one big challenge that you have or what do you see coming in, in the next couple months for you? I can take this one on one of the challenges right now. So we were historically had a showback model. We've moved to a chargeback model and we are uh, getting the FAs that support the actual business units, PLs, uh, more involved. The challenge I'm having right now is uh, the training piece of the FA is getting them up to speed on just, because I know that they have so much 
so many other things on their plate. They're also, you know, in charge of forecasting um, and planning for all the other revenue and expenses in their P&Ls, but trying to help them, um, you know, one, just understand what cloud, you know, computing costs are, um, the dynamic nature of them, um, you know, what, how teams can go about forecasting, what tools are out there. So one of the challenges is just feeling like, it's a lot of information to onload onto them. What's, you know, a good path forward. I feel like I'm kind of repetitive in some aspects of, you know, things. Um, where do you find that kind of in between of giving them, you know, the right amount of knowledge to be able to, you know, help on their own, but also not, you know, you can overload someone with the information of FinOps very easily too. So that's definitely one kind of challenge area right now that I'm um, working through. I'd say change management. Um, I know our, our FinOps guy is constantly chasing down the what changed or what happened. And it's trying to pivot things so that people are giving him a heads up like, oh, hey, by next week, we're going to be moving everything into this new service and expect that bill to jump by X percent. Um, that's not a, a well choreographed plan at this point. It's kind of one off. Um, so I think that's a big challenge we have to tackle sooner than later. Yeah, I see that the common things I hear about is like training people, like having people that in this role, so getting the talent. And then there's a huge discussion around like tooling. Do we buy? Do we do we build? And so curious if you've had to make any of those trade-off decisions and you know what drives those, especially like buying FinOps tool tools. So we go through a cloud reseller for our AWS services. And the tooling is a value add that they provide for us. Um, and they've swapped out their tools. I think they're on the second tooling cycle now. Um, so we had experience with a couple different tools in the industry. Um, and, and so that was part of when we renewed our contract, making sure that we still had access to those tools. So we don't actually spend anything on cloud health or cloud checker. I can't remember which one we're using these days. And tools typically aren't plug and play. So do you feel like, is that a role of the FinOps team to like also get that tool in front of the engineer and end up working with your business metadata and so forth? Um, in our case, it's it's 100% the FinOps guy making the call. Because um, a lot of the, the way we use it is to ingest information from our bills and then parse it out into specific reports that, that he's crafted within the tool so that he can drive the charge back. So... I leave that entirely up to, to him and his purview, for sure. Yeah, speaking from the FinOps first, I guess in my company, um, I could say that I'm responsible for overseeing and kind of managing that tool. Um, for us, the way that we have our accounts set up, um, teams have one account for production, one for non-production. So in order for them to get a full view of their costs, I have to create different lens or views, perspectives for them to view their spend you know, together. Um, through a third-party tool rather than just going in the AWS console because of our limitations on, you know, permissions. Um, there's definitely, yeah, it's my responsibility for going in, you know, picking out different ways that we take the data and put them in, we use cloud health. So um, perspectives, they call them, um, make turning that into a meaningful way for, you know, whether it be, you know, business leads, business heads, tech heads, um, financial analysts, or even the engineers themselves to be able to go in and, you know, digest, um, filter, dig in, drill in on that information. So, yeah. yeah. I think that's a important component is having the resources that can help facilitate that and get out to the business. All right. I got two more questions. Maybe we'll open to the audience. Uh, I love the keynote talking about machine learning and AI. How do you see that impacting FinOps in um, a positive way? And then also how, what are, what, what may FinOps need to be cautious going into those new um, technologies? I don't yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too, too soon to tell maybe. Um, I, I, think, I think we'll see improved capabilities in predictive analytics and being able to forecast the spend. Um, but I don't know that beyond that, we're going to reap a lot of value in the carving up what we currently have. Cause we, I mean, that's a pretty prescriptive process for us. And that was a complete and total out of thin air answer. So <laughs> don't bet your business on that. All right. And since I'm here from the foundation, not for profit organization, I want more people to get into FinOps careers. 
leave everybody with maybe like a piece of advice of like uh, why they should consider as a career change? <laughs> Uh, I can start. If you're somebody who um, loves learning new things, um, are excited about or interested in a role that's continuously evolving, you'll never be, at least from what I've felt in this role, you're never going to learn everything you need to know. Things are continuously changing, continuously evolving. You're continuously challenged um, as new technologies are rolled out, et cetera. Um, this is a great career path, and there's so much value that you can, um, I think, really quantify. Um, in this role. Yeah, and uh, I'll add too, um, I think when the term was first kind of becoming probably popular in what, 2018, 19, um, it felt like it was just a, another cog in the wheel. Um, today, FinOps is an integrated part of the team. So your product um, owner, product manager should have the FinOps person in the same meetings with the engineers, and you're really kind of working towards the same problem now. So that's you would be part of the rest of the team is what I'm getting at. Yeah. yeah, I don't have a whole lot to add, Angela. That was a great answer. Um, yeah, I think FinOps is gonna become way more pervasive as cloud adoption continues to grow. And, and I think we're gonna start seeing it, you know, it's gonna leave the spreadsheets and infiltrate the engineering teams a lot more. These guys did so good. None of these questions were well rehearsed, so. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Um, thank you everyone for joining today. And um, today we're gonna talk about uh, how do you simplify modernization of uh, monolithic applications uh, using VPC Lattice networking, Amazon VPC Lattice. And uh, by way of introduction, my name is Sanket. I am a senior solutions architect for migration and modernization at the AWS Industries. And um, I have over uh, 15 plus years of IT industry experience, most of which is in, uh, in AWS. I've been with Amazon for uh, almost 8.5 years now, and I'm based out of Dallas. All right, before we start, I just wanna ask how many people here are AWS savvy? Um, oh, perfect. That's good. Perfect. All right. So um, today we're going to talk about um, how do we how do we uh, define monolith and microservices uh, applications, and um, how do you uh, decompose monoliths? Right. What are some of the decomposing strategies for uh, for monolith applications? And when developers and uh, cloud network admins, network admins, when they're working on um, microservices, building microservices, what kind of challenges uh, they face, right? Uh, so, so the challenges will be from uh, the network and application layer perspective. Then um, we will discuss Amazon VPC Lattice, which is a pretty new service. Uh, we launched it back in reInvent 2022. And we will discuss its basics and uh, security. And then uh, Amazon VPC Lattice in the context of uh, microservices. So how, how does it works with microservices? Then we will discuss uh, how Amazon VPC Lattice can solve modernization use cases, uh, such as breaking down the monolith applications and solving application dependencies. And then last but not the least, we will dive into um, discussing uh, microservice deployment strategies using Amazon VPC Lattice and summarize it. All right, so, so the basics first, right? So uh, we have the monolith application. Uh, what is a monolith application? So monolith application is a single tier uh, application that's uh, tightly coupled and um, very loosely defined. Uh, its user interface and data would be sitting on a single platform running on a single uh, environment. Microservices at the same time is exactly opposite of monoliths. Um, microservices is uh, nothing but a, a loosely coupled but tightly scoped um, uh, unit of application software that basically could run on different uh, environments. So if you have to take an example of an e-commerce application and define monolith and microservices, so within e-commerce application, there are several functionalities, right? Uh, you have the cart functionality, um, the product, uh, the uh, inventory functionality, the billing functionality. So um, if all these functionalities are basically running on a single platform, that's basically a monolith application. 
but when we kind of uh, loosely define them onto different platforms, uh, such as we built a card service, uh, uh, inventory service, or any other uh, product service, then it's basically uh, an microservice implementation of the e-commerce app. So what are some of the strategies that, um, uh, that we can use to decompose monolith applications? The first is the business capability. And what uh, I mean by business cap capability is what the business does, right? So for an insurance company, a business could be doing um, sales, marketing, customer service, right? So you would be decomposing your monolith application based on these business capabilities. Uh, business capabilities could be sur uh, further subdivided into uh, you know, subdomains. So within the marketing domain, you could have analytics uh, and then uh, campaigning as, as you know, services, right? So you can have um, microservices built based on the subdomains. Transactions uh, in a distributed system, uh, um, applications could be using multiple services to complete a full transaction. So uh, the idea behind using transaction mechanism is to basically group all the microservices together based on a single transaction. Uh, service per team pattern, and this is highlighted because we are going to talk about it in the next slide in more detail, but just to give you a gist of what I mean here, um, you could uh, basically define microservices in such a way that each microservice would be owned by a specific team in a way. Strangler fic pattern. Strangler fic pattern is a very popular pattern that's being used industry wide for decomposing monolith applications into microservices. Uh, in Strangler fic pattern, uh, you create microservices, but you slowly decompose the monolith until the until the microservices are uh, fully ready to be placed in production. And uh, last but not the least is the branch by abstraction pattern. So branch by abstraction pattern is kind of a leave and layer pattern where uh, you create a new version of the application, but the legacy version of the application will coexist with the new version. So both the versions of the application are running. So um, service, let's double click on, you know, service per team pattern. So as you can see here, right, we have, um, development teams that could be working on deploying, deploying microservices, right? Each developer or a set of developers could be having a dedicated sandbox AWS account in a real world environment where they would be deploying microservices. So as you can see, a deployer could be a, a development or, or a developer could be deploying um, microservices in a sandbox account in a dedicated VPC. For those of you who do not know uh, what VPC is, so VPC is a, um, isolated network environment where you would be launching your AWS resources. So developers are deploying microservices in, the, in a dedicated sandbox account or in a dedicated VPC. And then there are multiple developers who are doing the same thing, right? But these microservices are part of the same application, right? They need to be connected with each other. And um, these network isolations are not basically letting them do it. So how do you, how do you solve it, right? So these are some of the network application com uh, complexities that developers and network admins face. Let's take an example, right? Let's say um, AWS, uh, some developer, right, in a, in a, in a big company developing uh, microservices from a monolith application. They deploy the microservice version in a specific VPC in an AWS account, okay? Then um, some other developer or the, probably the same developer has created uh, a new microservice for the same application that's sitting in the in a different VPC again, right? Now VPCs cannot talk to each other directly. They, they need to be connected using a peering relationship or a transit gateway, right? So we create VPC peering and that helps connect microservices together. Okay, this keeps on growing. Developers are coming, deploying new microservices. Um, in an account, there could be like, 30, 50, 100 VPCs, right? And uh, having a VPC pairing relationship is not really scalable because it's a one-to-one -one mapping between the VPC pairing. So what do you, how do you solve it? You solve it using a transit gateway, right? Transit gateway is a hub and spoke kind of network device, which basically connects VPCs together. So now instead of having multiple pairing relationships, you have only one transit gateway that's connecting 
the uh, connecting all the VPCs and then connecting the microservices. But this keeps on growing. In an enterprise environment, there could be more than one account. Uh, some de other developer in the same organization is uh, deploying microservice in a different VPC in a different account. It needs to be connected, right? So what they do is they create another transit gateway and peer that with the uh, transit gateway of the, uh, of the account one. But enterprise environments or enterprise organizations not only have one or two accounts, we are talking about hundreds of hundreds of accounts and thousands of VPCs. The point I'm trying to make here is you can add more and more network devices like internet gateway, VPC, private link, transit gateways. You will have thousands of route tables on each one of them. You could be uh, managing so many routes, so many peering relationships that it really gets difficult for the network admins to develop or, or, to, or to maintain all these network devices, right? So that's a networking problem from, uh, from network admins perspective. From the developer's perspective, when they're deploying these microservices, they have to worry about how the microservices connect with each other, right? So that's also a, um, an increasing time to market kind of problem for developers. Similarly, this is layer four or layer three network problems. There could be layer seven application routing problems also, right? Where you want to have a consumer uh, that's sitting in account one and wants to talk to the uh, microservices that's sitting in some other account, right? And you need to implement some sort of path-based or host-based routing. So again, you need to implement a API gateway with a network load balancer or an application load balancer to do path-based or layer, layer seven routing. And um, in an actual enterprise environment, this is how it would look like. And you, you might be looking at this diagram and wondering, okay, do I have to really, you know, understand all of these things, right? Same, same kind of idea uh, a developer also has, right? Developer ha doesn't have to worry about all these uh, private links, uh, load balancers, network devices, right? It's not really for the developers to be, to be network wizards. So how do we make it simpler for developers and network admins to connect and deploy microservices securely? So back in reInvent 2022, which was last year, Amazon launched uh, Amazon VPC Lattice, which basically uh, helps connect services together securely. And uh, it basically bridges the gap between the developers and the network admins. So Amazon VPC Lattice has four concepts in general. The first is the uh, Lattice Service Network. The Lattice Service Network is nothing but a uh, logical boundary that defines that basically that sorry that basically spans across VPCs and accounts. And um, you can also apply uh, certain common access and observability policies on them. Now, um, within the Lattice Service Network, you could have Lattice Services that are nothing but a unit of uh, software running or a unit of application, right? And that could be hosted on either uh, serverless environments or containers or, uh, you know, Kubernetes clusters. Uh, Lattice service directory is a centralized registry of services. And uh, fourth is the authentication policies, which are nothing but IAM resource policies that can be applied on the service network itself or on the services to do a request level authentication and context specific authorization. So if you look at this diagram here, you can see that there are three services, service A, service B, service three, uh, service C, and these are um, lattice services. When I say service, I'm, I mean that, you know, these are services in the, con in the context of VPC lattice. And uh, the, the square that enca encapsulates them is basically nothing but a service network. Uh, VPC Lattice security has uh, three layers of security. The first is the service and the VPC association. So uh, when you create a service network and the Lattice services, you need to associate Lattice services with this Lattice service network. And um, the consumers of those services um, also need to have their VPCs associated with the Lattice service network. We will, we will look into that in more detail in the next slide. But just know that you know with the service associations and the VPC associations, you could uh, implement a layer of security. 
The next layer of security is the uh, network layer control, where you can apply security group and network ACL policies on the on those VPCs that are associated with the service network. And the last layer of security is nothing but the VPC lattice authentication policies. And these are again the IAM resource policies that you will be implementing on the service networks or on the lattice services. So how does lattice works in the context of microservices? Now let's say microservices are being deployed by developers in account A and account B. Um, in, uh, it's sitting in the service VPC. In the account B, it's sitting uh, somewhere uh, within the region context, right? Now you want to connect these services together and you also want to have this consumer talk to these services, both of them, right? And without any sort of implementation of network devices, how would you do it? Well, VPC Lattice would come to rescue in this case, right? So you, the first step that you would do is you would create a Lattice service network. Um, either you can create it in account B or in account A. Let's say you create in account A. You can share this Lattice service network with the, um, with the account B using the resource access manager service. Now, for those of you who do not know what's a resource access manager, it's a service provided by AWS that helps share your resources and services across accounts. So you can now share service network with account B. Once you do that, you can now create service associations uh, with account B services as well as account A services, okay? And the consumer needs to talk to the, these services, right? So it needs to be part of the service network also. So you would create a VPC association from the consumer VPC with the service network. And that's how you can implement uh, or you can place your microservices and connect them together using Amazon VPC Lattice. That's a very simple concept. Let's uh, you know double click on it. And uh, let's take a look at how, what are some of the modernization use cases that you can solve with Amazon VPC Lattice. So uh, the first, uh, modernization use case that I want to talk about is breaking down the monolith applications into microservices. And to simplify this, uh, this use case, I want to take an example of .NET based e-commerce application. Now an e-commerce e application has several functionalities as I mentioned previously, right? It could have a card service. It could have an authentication service. It could also have inventory service, which is not showed here, but we'll talk about that. And then, um, it's a .NET based application. So developers can use uh, another service, which is called AWS microservice extractor to, to build microservices out of this e-commerce application. So developers already um, deployed card service and authentication service in two different accounts. Now, the next step is, uh, is basically to, to implement the Amazon VPC lattice, right? So that we can connect these services together. So it's always recommended that you create a dedicated network account, uh, specifically in an enterprise environment where you have thousands of accounts, right? You always want to have a dedicated network account which you can use for uh, network uh, traffic inspection uh, and, and again, implementing the service network. So in the network, in the service network account, you have deployed a lattice service network. And this Lattice service network is now shared with all the accounts uh, using the resource access manager. So uh, once, once you do that, you can then create Lattice services for the authentication service and the card service. And then you can apply policies on all of them. And these policies are nothing but the IAM policies that you will be applying on the Lattice service and the Lattice service network. And then you kind of create the associations, right? So you would be creating uh, service associations that are shown in the red line, whereas uh, the VPC association that's shown in the yellow line. So now your consumer of the application, of the e-commerce application can talk to uh, your e-commerce application uh, functionalities, the card service and the authentication service. Another modernization use case that um, comes very often when uh, industry customers are building uh, these big uh, applications, right, is application dependency. Uh, in the previous slide, we saw consumers are talking to the services, right? But services could be talking to other services also, right? For example, let's say 
in an e-commerce application again, um, I have I have a consumer who is going to place an order on the e-commerce application, and before the billing service confirms that order that the uh, that the customer has placed, it needs to talk to the inventory service just to make sure that that product is available before it confirms the order, right? So the so the billing service needs to talk to inventory service. So how do you how do you solve this application dependency? We'll take, let's take a look. Um, so again, e-commerce application, and we not need to solve uh, application dependency. We have inventory service that is sitting in one provider account, billing service that's sitting in another provider account, and then the uh, card service. And um, you have a service network account that has the latest service uh, policy applied. Now the let's take these scenarios one by one. So billing wants to talk to inventory. So the billing uh, services VPC needs to be associated in this case with the service network because uh, you know it's the billing service that's going to initiate that traffic. The inventory wants to talk to the card service. So inventory VPC would be associated and you don't want to have billing service talk to card service in the third case. So what you can do is you can implement a uh, fine-grained policy on the service network itself or on the service to make sure that billing service cannot talk to uh, to the card service. So that's how you can uh, solve application dependency by simply associating the services with the service network in Amazon VPC Lattice and implementing the right permissions in the IAM resource policies. Next, I wanna quickly talk about the microservice deployment strategies that uh, you can uh, uh, implement using Amazon VPC Lattice. So the first, um, first, first um, way of doing deployment is weighted routing. And uh, as you can see, oops, what's going on? Yeah, so as you can see, there are um, currently, Two services, auth service sitting in VPC one, card service sitting in VPC two, and the consumer, right? So all the associations are in place already. Service networks have been created. Okay, that's fine. I want to. I am um, a developer. I want to create a new version of the card service. So I did that. I created a card plus plus service. Uh, it's a new version of the card functionality, and it's been deployed in VPC three. But now I want to make sure that this consumer when it accesses the cards functionality for an e-commerce application, there should be a split between the traffic, right? Uh, between the old card functionality and the new card functionality. So what I would do is I will first associate this new card service with the service network, with the existing service network. And then I, I can implement a weighted routing policy such that um, I can say, okay, 80% of the traffic should go to the card service. 20% of the traffic should go to the new card plus plus service, right? And that way I would be testing the card plus plus service before it goes into production. So slowly I would be increasing this traffic on the, on the card plus plus service and then decompose the ca old card service uh, completely, right? So that's a, that's a way of doing a blue green deployment where you have a blue environment, a green environment, which is going to be the new environment. And then you simply, um, you know, split the traffic and uh, take the green environment into production. So the next is uh, path and host-based routing. You can, uh, with, with Amazon VPC Lattice, you can also do path-based routing and host-based routing. For example, the consumer, when talking to a specific service, uh, if they are accessing the uh, slash API slash card uh, path of the domain, then it should go to the card service. If they're accessing slash API slash auth, auth, then it should go to the auth service. Similarly, if they if you can also implement host-based um, host based, uh, routing where you can have the auth.example.com uh, example traffic go to auth service and then card.example.com um, go to card service. So, if I want to deploy a new version of the new version of the card service, which is going to be the new card, I can implement uh, the same thing. I can I can do path based or host based routing, and have the traffic go to the new card, and then I will simply cut over the um, 
the uh, the traffic from the cart functionality to the new cart functionality right so this is one time straight cutover of the traffic it's not a slow decomposition of the old monolithic uh, old microservice so that's how you can use the feature within uh, amazon vpc lattice which is basically the path based and host based routing to do uh, deployment so um, i know we only have like 7 minutes left so i just want to quickly summarize what we talked about uh, vpc lattice implement service to service communication it basically helps you connect services together and securely with uh, by implementing zero trust architectures then vpc lattice helps with uh, with uh, with implementing a permanent network strategy for your uh, for placing your microservices and that way developers don't have to worry about setting up uh, and again network admins also don't have to worry about you know setting up networking and how microservices can be connected with each other all they have to care about is um, simply uh, deploying the microservices and then implementing them uh, with amazon vpc lattice and amazon vpc lattice would then take care of all the the network routing and uh, use the amazon overlay overlay network at the back end to do the uh, to do the heavy lifting of the you know network traffic oops uh, modernization use cases uh, so amazon vpc he lattice helps you solve modernization use cases such as monolith to uh, breaking monolith to microservices and application dependency and uh, amazon vpc lattice also helps with uh, deploying uh, deploying microservices uh, using like you know weighted routing and path and host based routing so that's it uh, and that's all uh, i had got and um, there is a survey um, that you can fill if let us let me know how how the session was this was only for 30 minutes so i had to you know basically wrap it up quickly but uh, let me know you know if the session was helpful can you hear me great so i'm going to start you know already you know already and, and it's, it's a pleasure, pleasure to be here today, today. It's, my it's my first time in chicago, in chicago. I, flew I flew in late last late night because i was at the aws summit, summit in toronto where i gave where the I gave same talk, talk. But, but the slides, the slides, slides i didn't have these slides, slides they weren't branded so they didn't get to experience the full experience of the presentation but yeah, but great, yeah great to be here. here. My name my is Julia. Julia. I'm a global, I'm a global technologist, technologist at Veeam. I'm also I'm an also AWS, AWS community builder, a CNCF ambassador. ambassador. I run some, I run meetups, some meetups in New York. In New York. So if you're so ever in New York, York, you're more you're than more welcome, than welcome to, come. to come. And before and working before at Veeam, Veeam, I used to work, used work for, an MSP. for an MSP. And if you don't and know what MSPs are, they stand for Managed Service Provider. And they provide IT services for other companies. And usually these companies, they come Go to they the go MSP to the MSP for three for reasons. Three reasons. They, they, they want to they hire, want to their, hire their services for three reasons. For three reasons. First, because they are looking, they're for, looking the for the expertise, so they don't want to hire in house, house, and they 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 want they want a specific a expertise, expertise of the engineer, an engineer, security, security or whatever. Or whatever. Second, because they, they, they want to cut costs, so also they don't they don't hire in house, but they want they want a twenty four seven support. And third reason is because they fucked up and they want they want us to fix. It. And this and is this what my, is talk, what my is talk is about. So things so that, things I've, that seen I've seen throughout the years of uh, uh, bad uh, habits that people that have people on have the cloud, on AWS, on AWS, and what and we can, what do, we about can do about it, so best practices. practices. I have eight, I have eight bad, habits, bad habits, but I know there are a lot more. more. I just didn't, I just have, didn't time have time to cover all of them. All of them. And, and, and there's, if there's one thing I want you, I want, I want to leave you with, you with uh, even, even if you don't remember you don't anything, remember anything, anything of, the of the presentation, is the AWS, AWS, AWS well architected, well architected framework. framework. This framework, this framework is a is set of set best practices, practices that you can that you review, can review uh, uh, with, uh, your with your company and see and if you're following, if you're following them, them. Also, you can, you can leverage, leverage it throughout, throughout the, years the years to see how you're, how you're evolving. evolving. So, it, so it's a great it's a way, way, and you can also, you can also maybe maybe reach out, reach out to, to your AWS team and see if they have a solution architect to go there and review that with you, so they can bring more insights to your to company. your company so great so tool, great you, tool. You, should, uh, you should check uh, it out check it out First, First bad, habit bad habit is starting, starting off, off on the wrong, on the wrong foot. foot so, so AWS, AWS sucks, sucks at creating, creating default, default accounts, accounts. 
The root account, the root account is, is over permissive. You can, you can do, everything do everything with it. With it. You, can you, can you can even destroy, destroy your, your, account, your, account, your, environment. your environment. That's why, That's I, call why it, I call it. Uh, I, uh, I say uh, it's um, um, like a Pandora, like a Pandora box. box. I created I that, that image, image uh, with AI, AI, so that's so why the AWS, AWS is kind of weird. Kind of weird. But, but it's a Pandora, it's a Pandora box. box. You can you destroy, can destroy your, environment. your environment. So you have, so to, you have to take, take care, care, of care of it. Have, have a, a very, very strong, strong password. password. Enable, Enable MFA, MFA and, and save uh, and save uh, that key, key or even, or even you know, you know uh, put uh, it in, put a it safe. in a safe. A lot of people, lot of do, people that do that if they have they you know, have 2FA, 2FA, 2FA because. because oops, oops. Wait, wait. Sorry. Because, because if, anything if anything ever happens, ever happens to, the root, to account, the root account, you're done. You're done. And also, and also one thing, thing that, that um, you should you do, should do is, is just share it, share it with, with three people. Three people. I don't say, I don't say one, person one person should have, should have the, the, the access, access to it, to it because, because if that person that ever person leaves the company, the company if they, they go away, go away with, with the root account, account. But, but three, three people, people is a good is a number, number, you know, you because, because you can, you can still, still keep a, a keep track, a track uh, uh, if uh, anyone uh, uh, uses uh, the account, uh, account, you know, it's you know, good, it's to, good monitor. to monitor, and you can and also, you can also get, get alarms if anyone logs in the account and take action on that. So, yeah, keep that in mind. Use the first set up your environments and then stop using the root account. Please, please. Next, Next bad, bad habit, habit is improper, improper IAM implementation. implementation. So, so if you're if you if you have if you have more accounts, more accounts which we should, should have should have and we're going to talk about that, about that on the next, on the next slide, slide you should be using IAM identity center instead of IAM. IAM is, IAM is great, 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 but it can be, can be um, man, um, man, too manual, too manual and, and, and you can end up giving more permissions than needed. So not following the least privileged principle. And with IAM identity center, you can authenticate. To SAML. to SAML, so, so it's, it's, it's the, the, the previous, previous AWS, AWS SSO, SSO, and you can, and have, you can federated have federated users. users. You just, you just on, a on a single account, account you, can, you can, you know, manage, you know, manage all, all the users. users. You can you give, can them, give them, them permissions. Yeah. Uh, so easy. So for instance, someone someone new on your, your um, uh, in, on your in your company, company. company. they get they in. You can can provision all the accounts from a single place. They, they can, can also log, log in from a single uh, window, like you can you can see there from a single console. So it's much easier for you and for them. Um, and and that's what AWS wants. They want to make to your, make your job, job easier. easier. So, so uh, take, take that, in, that mind. in mind. Also, also there, there are, are long, uh, shorter term, term credentials, credentials compared, compared to, to IAM. IAM. And, um, and um, my, my advice, advice is to get, get this figured, figured out, out early and, and get, get your engineers, engineers to, to, to start using, using AWS, AWS Identity Center. Center. Because, because if you start, if you start with AM, AM and then and down the road you ask them, oh, give us back your your credentials gonna be, it's way, gonna be harder way harder than to get them to start using SSO. SSO. So, 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 so start, start with that, that and even AWS, AWS is pushing everyone, everyone to start, to start using, using IAM, IAM Identity, Identity Center, Center instead of just, just IAM. IAM. Next, Next uh, bad, uh, bad habit, habit mistake, mistake is the, is the lack of, of multi-account multi governance. governance. So, like I, so mentioned, like I mentioned, you should have, you multiple, should have multiple, multiple accounts. accounts. But, but what, what I currently, currently see even at, even at Veeam, at Veeam is, that is that a lot of a people, lot of people they, use they use a single account, account for all their environments. So production, so production staging, staging, development, development backup. backup. And, and if, if you get hacked, you get hacked if your, your, your account, one of your accounts gets compromised, Compromised. What the well, chances, chances of, of losing everything, everything are, are very big. Very big. So, so you should you be, should you know, know isolating, isolating each account, each account depending, depending on business, business needs, needs or, or you know risks. No risk. And, and AWS, AWS makes, makes very, very easy, very easy to, manage to manage them, them with, AWS with AWS organizations. organizations. It's, it's, it's something it's free, free and, um, and makes your, makes life, your easier life easier as well. As well. You, can you can group accounts, group accounts that are similar, similar or, have or have similar, similar permissions, permissions into OU, so, so organization, organization units. units. And, uh, and uh, there, there are even benefits, benefits of using AWS organizations. organizations. You can have you can consolidated billing, so you can see everything that you're spending on 
on all, all, your, on accounts, all your accounts and with, and those, with metrics, those metrics you can, you can you know, make, you know, changes, make changes, see where, where you're, you're overspending, overspending or, or why you shouldn't, you shouldn't be using, using and, uh, and uh, also you can you do can discount, do discount sharing. sharing. So, so if you have if you reserved, have reserved instances, instances or serving, or serving, uh, uh, saving, saving, saving plans, plans on one on account, account and then you don't use everything, you can use in one of the other accounts under the AWS organization. So it's beneficial and AWS made it very easy for everyone to use that. Um, next mistake, bad habit, is managing, managing infrastructure, infrastructure manually. manually. So, so if, if you set, set up your, your infrastructure, infrastructure by, by using the web, the web console, console you're, you're, you did it manually, manually and, uh, and uh, you're, you're, you're prone, prone to a lot, to a lot of errors, errors and, and having, having to repeat, repeat that. that. Also, also, it's, it's not, not documented. documented. So, so for the next people that come uh, in, your, in, your, in your team, they won't they know, won't know how, how to provision the resources, the resources if they need to do that, that again. again. And, and that's, that's why infrastructure, infrastructure as code is so important and becoming very popular nowadays. Because just with lines of code, you can create a template, use it. Uh, there are a lot of tools, CloudFormation, CTK, Terraform, Plumi. So, um, and you just with a few lines of code, you can deploy everything, infrastructure, your apps. And like I said, it's uh, repeatable, scalable, redeployable, scalable, documented. So this is very important. Documentation, documentation is, is the heart, the heart of, of everything for, 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 for all organizations. I think like we don't, we don't pay, pay enough attention, attention to, that. to that. Also, also consistent, consistent and less human, human error. error. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah get, uh, I see um, established, established in, your in your organization. So it, so becomes, it becomes the actual way, way of working, of working and, uh, and uh, deploying resources. Next, next um, um, is insufficient measures to protect, protect the data. The data. I, who, I, has who has heard of, of the shared, shared responsibility, responsibility model, model on AWS? on AWS? Okay, not, not, a, lot, not a lot of people. I wish everyone had, had, had raised their, their hands. Their hands. But, but the shared, shared responsibility, responsibility model, model it's actually, it's actually on all the cloud providers. But on AWS, they, they say, say that, that, that they have, they have the responsibility of securing the of the security of the, of the, cloud, of the cloud, meaning the infrastructure, infrastructure. You know, you know keep sure that, sure that the, the, all the regions, all the regions are, up. are up. Don't don't, don't, ask, don't ask me days ago, days ago what happened. What happened. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, you know, infrastructure security of the cloud, of the cloud and, it's, and the, it's customer's the customer's responsibility, responsibility to, uh, to uh, take, care uh, take care of the security in the cloud. So customers' data patches. To, you know, you know, taking care, taking of, care operating of operating systems, systems things like things that. Like that the, customer's the customer's responsibility. responsibility. And, and the data, the data is, is a lifeblood of organizations. organizations. If you lose, if your, you data, lose your data, you lose everything. everything. Um, and, 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 you need, and you need, I think it's, I think one, it's of the one of the most important, important things, things that you should, you should pay attention. attention. And, uh, and uh, things, that things that you can do, can do is encrypt, encrypt your data, your data and, and trends and address rest. You can you use, can use AWS, AWS Manager, Manager in AWS, AWS Management, Management Services. Services. Also, you, also can you can use secrets so create so secret secrets for your passwords, for your passwords APIs, APIs, important, important information, information that, that, you that you want to be, to be secure. secure. Also, also, you should, you should have, have a recovery focus strategy. strategy because, because you should be, should be thinking, thinking of having, of a, having a resilient and high and high available um, infrastructure, infrastructure always, always because, because you don't want you don't want to have, have, have any downtime. You know, you what, know happened what happened two or three, two days, or three ago, days ago? You, you should you, be you should be prepared, prepared for that. For that. So, so uh, uh, with, that, with that, you should have a backup strategy. You should you know create a Schedule back for backup, to back up to your, back apps, your apps, back up your data, data, data back up your infrastructure. infrastructure. Also, also, you should, you should um, um, be. We, 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 say we say there is a there three, is a three to one rule, famous rule. So have so three have different three copies, copies of data, of data on two different media. One of them one being offsite, off and, and Veeam has added plus one and plus, one and plus zero, zero, which means uh, the one is being off 
Um, offline, offline area, area or, or immutable, so immutability is very easy on S3. Just, just uh, uh, check, uh, check a box. And the zero, zero is no errors, errors after, after backup, backup recoverability, 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 recoverability verification. So you, so need, you need to need test testing testing your, backups. your backups. Because, because what, what, happened, what, happened, happened, what happens if you, you, need backup, you need a backup and then you and then realize, you realize that, that your backup was corrupted, corrupted as well, as well you, 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 you're, you're, lost. you're lost. So you, so need, you need to test testing as well. As well. Don't, don't, don't just, just uh, schedule, uh, schedule it and forget about it. You need also to be taking care of it. And, and uh, have, have a disaster, disaster recovery, recovery plan. plan. So uh, failover, and uh, if anything happens, you can go from one region to, to the other, or from one cloud to another. You know, it's very important to have all of these documented down, written down, so your whole team is aware of that, and 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 so no one goes and calls you in the middle of the night. What should I do? No, everything is written down and documented. I like to say that. If you aren't breaking and testing disaster recovery, you don't have disaster recovery. So yeah, uh, people usually they forget about this, uh, but it's very, very important. Next mistake is not prioritizing cost management. This, this is one of the most challenging aspects of moving of cloud hosted apps and data, uh, because a lot of times there is a bill shock you start you know, deploying a lot of things, clicking here or there, a few lines of code. And then in the end of the month, you see a huge number and you have to pay that, you know, it's, your credit card is there. So you need to be, you need to keep this in mind. And there is even um, a term uh, um, coined, uh, FinOps, that uh, it's basically to develop a culture of awareness of cost optimization and uh, also having cost optimization as an architecture concern. So everything that you're building, you should have cost, cost optimization, optimization in mind. mind. Also, also you your are engineers, they should, they should have you, you if you're an engineer, engineer or, or if you're a manager, manager they should, should have visibility on cost. Because, because I've, I've seen, seen a lot, a lot of, times, of times, you know, you know resources that are used, are used just for development, development, development testing. testing. They could, they could, they could be they turned, off. turned off, and people, and people just, just leave it, leave it because they don't, don't care. It's, it's not their, their goal. Their goal, goal, their goal, their goal to, be to be optimizing, optimizing costs. Cost. So this, so this is just one of the one of the examples that, uh, that uh, everyone should be working as a team. And this is this is what FinOps does. So basically, finance. Operations, operations and, 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 and working together, together, IT, working together, together towards, towards the same goal. Same goal. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's very important because, like you see in this image, image. Before, before, it used to be a very, a very slow process. process. Uh, IT, uh, IT asked ask procurement, procurement for something, for something, something like, like they needed to provision, provision of server. server. And then, and then uh, procurement, procurement would ask for the authorization of the finance, finance team. Finance would authorize it. They would purchase it send it back to IT, you know, it would take weeks. And now we've just, since it's a pay-as-you-go model, engineers, they can just write a few lines of code and, and you know, have, have everything up or down, down if, if it doesn't, doesn't work. work. And, and, and they are the ones that need to have costs in mind as well. So very important. And I wrote there, pay less for what you use. So means using saving plans, reserved instances, uh, discounts. Also use less, meaning shut down idle resources and uh, remove orphaned disks or whatever. And also optimize usage. So right, right size, whatever you have and analyze what to use, use from an from efficiency, efficiency standpoint. standpoint. And, and um, next, overlooking, overlooking interesting, interesting data. data. AWS, AWS has, has a lot, a lot of metrics, metrics that, that you could, you could be, be using to make, make your environment, environment or architecture, architecture better, better and, and even, even, you know, you know uh, uh, saving costs. Uh, uh, a lot of, a lot of them are out of the box, box, so AWS, AWS Cloud, Cloud Trail, Trail Flow Logs, ELB. A lot of them are also free. And ELB Access Log. Amazon Guard Duty. It has it's a service that has some services inside, and you can get 
get a lot of data for security purposes. So always pay attention to those. They can give you great insights about your architecture, why you're doing right, what you do wrong, wrong, what you can improve. And use cases, troubleshooting, auditing, auditing, and analytics, and CM, CM, security incidents and, and event management. So, so don't, 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 overlook don't overlook the data, the data that, that you get on, on, on AWS. AWS. And I, 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 I'm sure, sure you know, know, you um, know um, monitoring, monitoring and open telemetry, telemetry has been becoming, becoming a big thing. thing. So, so data, data, uh, this data is very important, very important to, to improve your, 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 your posture. And finally, and finally, I just I just added this slide, slide today because, because at the summit yesterday, yesterday they were talking, they were talking a, lot a lot about that. that. You know, there were you know, there were booths for, for certification, booths explaining, explaining the, the resources on AWS. AWS. And I thought, and I thought, why not add this? this? You should, you should always, always be killing, killing yourself because, because it's, it's why why it's not, it's enough, not enough to have the tools, the tools that, that AWS, AWS provides. provides. You need you need to be know how to know how to use this tool. To know how to use them, well. them well because if because you just if you just know a little bit, a little bit you might you might be using, using them, wrong. them wrong so, so there, 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 there are a lot of, lot of uh, uh, tools AWS, AWS skill, skill builder has it has, it has class 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 which is a game a game game, 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 game fight resource, resource AWS, AWS educate AWS part um you you should try to get get certified it's a road road map to how to study also join the join the community AWS has amazing amazing communities they're always they're always help, help if you have questions, questions. And, I and I think it's think great, great to be involved in the community, in the community because, because you, get you get to see other use other cases, use cases what, other what other people, people are doing that you, that could, you emulate. could emulate. A lot of times, you, you know, you get ideas, get ideas and, 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 and you can you only, can get, only get, get that by being, by being the community. The community. So, so, yeah, AWS has great, great tools and you can even evaluate yourself with go on AWS. AWS, 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 AWS slash training. training. You can, you, you know, can, you know, fill up a form and evaluate what are, what are those skills that, that you're that liking, liking and, 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 and it's and good, you know, you know, to, to learn better learn about, better about what, you, what you could do. And with and that, with that um, um, I, I appreciate you being here, being here and, uh, and uh, being interested in, in improving, you know, improving your, your, your habits, habits on AWS. AWS. There are a lot, are a lot more, more, but those, yes, are those are the main, the main ones, ones and, and, and important, important ones, ones that you should, that you should keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And yeah, if you, and have, yeah, if questions, you have questions, I don't know if I don't you have, know a, if mic, you have a mic, I can shout, shout out, out. So I'll, I'll repeat the question, and I'll be here, we can connect on social media, social media always, we don't have to answer questions. questions. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no? No, no questions? questions? <laughs> Great, I don't, Wait, know, I don't know what the next... The next. Talk, talk is. is and I think, and I, think I, I can share, I can this, share slide this slide if you want. You know, you can, you know, you send, can me send me a message, and I believe, I believe you know, I don't know if they're going to share this slide. Then you're going to share this slide. Here, you're you're going to share this slide. Good. Good. Cool. 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 Because I, I, these slides, slides are cool. Yeah. Yeah. Theme, theme, breaking bad. Theme. Bad theme. Who watched the Breaking Bad here? Just. Just. Okay. Okay. Good. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you yeah, are. You are. <laughs> <laughs> it should be a pre requirement to come to, talk? to my talk. Only people, Only people that, people watch, that watch Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> uh, so I'm glad that all of you are here today for you know, the AWS community event. I am a uh, AWS uh, partner solution architect and work with various partners on the AWS side, uh, uh, mainly software partners, and have seen uh, their journey towards building enterprise SaaS solutions and uh, want to share some of the learnings uh, which they have got from it. Uh, so that if your team are thinking of probably leveraging SaaS solutions yourself, or even building SaaS solutions. You can take some points away from today's uh, discussion. I know it's the last, uh, it has been a long day and it's uh, been, uh, I'm just between you and the happy hour. So I'll try to make it quick and hopefully you catch 
the key points uh, for uh, you know by which you can probably develop something on your your uh, organization as well. So I want to focus on you know uh, this number, uh, 250 billion. Uh, this was the estimated uh, SaaS solution size for uh, 2022. Uh, looks like a very big number, but compared to the total IT spend, which is the, which was probably done last year, estimated to be 4.4 trillion, it's still a very small uh, amount. What we see that in future, the SaaS market size is going to increase at a much larger scale. Uh, this gives a lot of businesses a very key initiative towards developing and building their SaaS solutions. We see that the appetite uh, with large enterprises, uh, even getting and uh, adopting these SaaS solutions has been increasing. Uh, we have seen it across various industries. It's not like uh, one industry, which is compliance and regulatory would keep away from SaaS solutions. Uh, we are seeing that and uh, you know, the SaaS providers are enabling these enterprises by making their solutions the right fit so that any kind of enterprise can adopt those solutions. So what is SaaS? So from on AWS side, we define SaaS as you know any uh, software delivery model. It's a, basically a software delivery model which enables an organization to offer a solution with low friction. So the key point here is low friction and a service centric approach. Lot of enterprise providing, like you know, uh, companies who provide software or uh, to enterprises have been focused on product centric approach. Uh, these softwares were deployed in the enterprise uh, data centers. So this, uh, and the life cycle for those products was very different. Uh, usually it has uh, you know, a quarter, like quarter to quarter was not even thought of. It used to be an annual cycle or even larger cycles than that, uh, where a product release, a major release would happen probably a few years, and then you would provide patches and uh, uh, long uh, term support for it for a quite a while. Moving to a SaaS solution is a big culture shift for various, like a lot of these organizations. Uh, but the thing is, there are a lot of these software providers have to make that switch because the whole industry is changing. There is a big appetite to consume SaaS services. Uh, the market is changing very fast. So if we see what happened, uh, in the past few years with the pandemic, the way in which uh, you know services were, uh, or even products and services, both in supply chain as well as service models, uh, the requests which were coming in were kind of a pendulum shift, all right? So we were, went a lot of into good services, then again uh, into like once things opened up, uh, the consumption of services has gone up. So to map that, all the organizations, all the enterprises have to keep their business segments pretty up to date and modern so that they can come up with new solutions uh, to target their customers. So we have seen that for from enterprise perspective for digital transformation, this is a survey which was done by a uh, you know, uh, third party, but uh, AWS did uh, conduct that. And we see that the software as a service has been a key indicator or uh, as, as pointed out in the survey by a lot of these enterprises that that is the strategy they are looking for, for digital transformation. Uh, they understand that there might be other important aspects in their business as well, but to leverage software as a service Basically, if, if, if you're a provider of software as a service, it helps you towards getting that growth factor for your company. It improves your multiplier for your, you know, uh, for your stocks. So that, that's a great fit. For a consumer of software as, as a service, it helps you to uh, you know, launch new product and services faster. Uh, in traditional data centers, where all the products had to be installed and managed by your own teams, it's a very heavy lift. Uh, even when it's managed on AWS, it's still a heavy lift. 
So what we have seen is we have worked with like AWS has worked with a lot of its partners to onboard and help them build SaaS solutions. And these SaaS solutions then make that effort to deploy any software on AWS pretty easy. So they can get started easier, build their business applications faster and not uh, worry about, you know, patching and upgrading the software. Let's start building. That's the whole thing. And building at the very upper tier level where your business needs are. So it's a business model, as I said. One of the key aspects of it, uh, when you have to think about building your own SaaS is the agility. Why would customers want your solution? Uh, it's about how fast you can you know, uh, adopt it. There are various aspects around, you know, the, uh, uh, serverless is a very key initiative these days. So, uh, and scaling is a very key initiative. So how fast you can adopt those SaaS services is there capability to scale up and scale down? Those are you know, key metrics uh, there. Innovation, as I said, from a product-driven approach where uh, you know, pro uh, softwares were uh, developed towards uh, you know, having uh, product releases every year or every other year, we are seeing very fast innovation cycles in SaaS products. Uh, we, we can have a bi-weekly or a quarterly update for a lot of these SaaS solutions, which helps to get the best to their customers as soon as you know, uh, they want. Uh, again, there is way, uh, even if it's provided in a product manner where you know you are providing patches, it, there is a lift on the customer side to install those patches and bring that product up to mark. But with uh, a software as a service solution, uh, because it's provided as a service, all these product improvements can immediately be shared with the customer. Now there is something key aspect around operational efficiency. Uh, the whole idea here is a lot of automation comes in when you build in a software as a service. And when you scale that to deploy it across hundreds or thousands of customers, you build that operational efficiency so that your team can then uh, you know, help your customers uh, develop things faster. That's the key aspect. So build that scale and build that automation to get the operational efficiency. And uh, one aspect around that is growth. As I said, as I showcased in the previous slide itself, the market share for SaaS is pretty small there. Why are we, you know, why are all the uh, partners and uh, customers of AWS getting into SaaS is again for that growth aspect. You have to design your service for that growth because like the whole industry is moving towards that growth. It's an industry which is uh, going to key uh, in and look at that growth. If you're not growing on your SaaS solution, then it's probably a not right fit uh, for what your customers are asking. You have to you know, go back, check, uh, because it's also focused on agility. You have to always keep checking and get a feedback from your customers. And what's the right fit of service which is needed and provide those, uh, you know, and that's what AWS like is also built on. Like Amazon is also built on customer obsession. We always want to look back and get feedback from our customers around what's the right fit or what's the new features in the services they would want. We are seeing that partners are also adapting the same customer obsession model here and they can then create better experience in the enterprise services. And it's reduced cycle time. So what we want to have with all of this is first the onboarding process for a SaaS service. We want to keep that as frictionless as possible uh, because that's the key, key differentiator, right? So once you have the onboarding process pretty smoothened out uh, and uh, the RTO for the customer is reduced, like they can easily onboard onto your solution and start developing things, that's when, we'll use, uh, when you will see the growth. Lot of the times it's uh, growth from two aspects. You, uh, for a lot of these SaaS companies, the growth comes from new customer acquisition. That's one channel. The second one is where there has been a customer acquisition, you see more expanded use of your services. So there are twofold aspect of growth, which you can see by SaaS. 
uh, you might have seen this slides a lot of times, you know, uh, around different uh, siloed models of deploying a SaaS solution. Uh, it's not, a, from my experience, what I've seen with partner uh, with partners and uh, like a lot of SaaS providers, it's not one or the other. Uh, you would have need, like most of the SaaS providers need all of these basket of pooling methods uh, to work for uh, across the board, right? There are some customers who would need that siloed approach, where, like, you know, a single tenant approach where everything is deployed in a separate account. Uh, they might have some compliance requirement or from their perspective to earn trust from that customer, it's harder. So you can go with that approach. The other approach on the right across the other, other, other end is the pool approach where all your customers are in a single pool. You do get much better operational excellence there, but uh, there might be, you know, you might have to keep up to date with all the compliance uh, requirements as well as new security features as in like, you know, uh, things are brought up. There is a mid ground approach also here, like the bridge approach where uh, what I've seen a lot of the customers, even like a lot of the partners, even if they can leverage the pool, big pool approach, what they do is uh, they use the bridge approach just from a perspective of also considering a blast radius, right? You want to reduce your blast radius. If things go wrong, and of course things go wrong, we always know things can go wrong. So when things go wrong, you don't want all of your customers having an impact. By having a middle bridge approach, you can then uh, limit that, you know, uh, let's say if uh, new features were released, which were incorrect, or there was a security break on one of your accounts, it's still limited in scope. And uh, that way, you, your, your overall SaaS services are not impacted. Now, I did mention around onboarding, right? So when it comes around onboarding, you want to smoothen out the onboarding process. A lot of times what we see is you can use your existing uh, application as well. Like a lot of SaaS companies, they start with that. Uh, they have a model of you know, how that application is deployed on-prem. Let's bring the same application on AWS. But there are these other uh, SaaS shared services which are specifically needed to bring that uh, you know, uh, like whole core, like the core is your application. We have to build all these walls around it, which will help with uh, the whole SaaS experience, uh, which are like routing. So whenever a new customer comes in, you want to route them. You want to provide a good identity structure. Uh, there is, uh, of course, the works which work will, which will be needed towards DevOps, uh, management and monitoring of your, uh, uh, so mainly the control plane for your application. Then for charge, like, you know, charging the customer, you would need metrics uh, and uh, billing and metering. So those, those are the key uh, features which are needed for any SaaS applications. Well, we uh, at AWS saw that this was, you know, one of the key elements which we can help some uh, uh, you know, startups or even anybody who is getting started to creating their SaaS application. So on AWS side, we have AWS SaaS Boost, which provides like, you know, that, that control plane, which creates, uses serverless applications to uh, uh, kind of build that whole control plane for you. So you can leverage this model, deploy it on your account, do your customizations and get started. It provides the uh, facilities for application configuration and automation as well. So if there are where you would deploy your core application that can be also brought in here. It provides the capability towards the, you know, uh, admin web panel as well. Uh, and it's all built with AWS services. Uh, there might be, you know, you might have custom applications. So of course, if there are certain specific requirements, you can update that, but the idea behind here is, uh, let's say you have an application today and you want to bring it and start like get, uh, and you want to get started. There is some groundwork which we, AWS has helped with. So this is something which you can take today and start working with right now. Uh, other than that, 
there are uh, other reference uh, solutions. So I did say SAS Boost is one of the solutions which is out there, but you have reference solutions in uh, EKS, which is the containerized reference solution. You have reference solutions in using just serverless services. So all these reference solutions are out there to help you get started. So if you have an app like core application or software, you can leverage these reference solutions, get started with building your uh, SaaS. You would of course need more uh, uh, pipeline or you know every application is very different. So you need more work here, but uh, it just gives you a blueprint to get started with and uh, your teams can then build more using this. So we want to accelerate this motion towards SaaS. On AWS, we have various uh, you know, engagement models as well. So uh, we have teams on AWS side, which can support you. Uh, so one of them uh, is on the SaaS, uh, SaaS factory. So where you, uh, your AWS team, if you're working with the AWS team, they can nominate you to, uh, to the AWS SaaS factory team. AWS SaaS factory has worked with various you know, uh, 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 SaaS providers and they have various learnings which they have got from those, uh, which then they, you know, we can consult, they can consolidate that learning based on what your specific needs are and work with you. So you can leverage the, you know, uh, the best practices, not only from the technology perspective, but also from the business perspective around pricing and, you know, then go to market. So they can help you with all those aspects. Uh, but of course we have limited bandwidth on our side as well. Like, you know, uh, it's a nomination process at times it might be harder for your teams or to match timelines. We have seen that, you know, though there is interest and uh, uh, from both parties, it can be a challenging task to get timelines and everything matched up. So there are resources which are available uh, public on a public portal right now, uh, which is AWS SaaS Factory Insights Hub, where the team has uh, build a large pool of uh, you know, SaaS enablement content. They have shared like you know, things around multi-tenancy, metering, billing, all those aspects. Uh, some of them are, you know, uh, as I said, like there's some accelerators, they are reference architectures, they are uh, use cases and customer success stories out there, which you can, your, when your team has challenges, they can learn from it. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, get that, uh, get the start anyways. And if you see there are roadblocks and your team needs help, uh, AWS SAs are there, like uh, we are, uh, uh, SAs and teams are there to support you towards that journey of building SaaS. What I've again seen for enterprise customers is compliance is a very big initiative. Like, you know, uh, it's not, easy to be compliant uh, on cloud. We ju just before this, we heard around you know, uh, the sh shared security model, right? So we, AWS does take care of the sec security of the cloud, uh, but security on the cloud is something which we expect our customers, uh, you would uh, take care of. Uh, but at the same time, we provide you with uh, certain services. Like I'll, I'll go over that. So, so we provide you with various services on AWS side to help you manage that risk. So for example, there's AWS config, which can be used to, you know, uh, compliance was always thought of uh, like you do your audit and probably it's not compliant after that, right? With AWS, we expect in cloud that uh, you can check compliance in real time. With AWS config and other tools, you can actually check that all your environment is compliant. You can specifically have rules uh, set configured, which will raise alerts if things are things uh, are not met. We have AWS Control Tower, uh, as as we just uh, heard before. This that okay? The root account. If you start with a root account, that's not the right way. You have like everything in there. It's not a very good way to get started. But AWS Control Tower is a mechanism where uh, you can leverage it to have a la whole landing zone for your organization where uh, different teams have different access. There are different uh, 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 policies which can be met at organization level and can be configured there. 
license manager, AWS systems manager, and like, you know, AWS cloud trail. So there are various services which we provide to get started on that security journey for you. Uh, you can oversee the risk using, you know, uh, guard duty or uh, AWS security hub and CloudWatch. Uh, we don't like, don't think you can, you know, just have to stop here, but at the same time, you can also leverage a lot of these partner e ecosystem tools that are out there uh, to leverage uh, uh, service compliance on AWS. So there are uh, various tools which you can use from partners as well. And at the same time, there is, uh, you know, on the assurance of the compliance side, there is audit manager and AWS artifact, which helps you towards that, uh, getting your compliance picture and sharing that with your end customers. Uh, we, yeah, so again, uh, so all this like is part like of your AWS well-architected uh, framework journey. I will go a little more deeper into that. Yeah. Uh, another thing which is part of compliance is like, you know, encryption and security, right? So encrypting data is very, uh, it's a very key feature, key thing, which is needed for, if you're building enterprise SaaS, you would need to encrypt the data at rest in transit and when your application is using it. Uh, but at the same time, there are like, you know, I have seen enterprises asking for more. Uh, uh, we see that and even partners are building uh, technology to support that what customers are asking for enterprises are asking for uh, you know uh, okay i want to encrypt all that data using my key so in case we want they want to revoke control of that data then they can do that so uh, because it's a saas solution if you're encrypting the data with my key and if i just want to revoke all the access i just have to take away the key and uh, the, the third party provider would not have access to the data so as a SaaS provider, you have to think about that. You know, what's the greatest and latest which customers are asking for in the security domain in data encryption, and I have to keep up with that. On TLS, at at this moment, we are on the AWS side. We are moving towards TLS 1.2 uh, uh, encryption, and uh, so that that's uh, at the same time. You know, uh, uh, you have to update your applications to support those mechanisms. Yeah. Uh, another thing which enterprises are looking for, you know, uh, you want to reduce the, uh, when it comes about security and compliance, you, you should think about it in layers. Uh, so you want to reduce any uh, threat vectors to your, day, uh, to your application as possible. One of it is by using uh, private connectivity. So by using private connectivity with, with AWS, what uh, here I have you know, uh, given a sample of how AWS private link works for uh, between a SaaS provider and consumer. Uh, the consumer think it's like the enterprise which is consuming the SaaS service. Uh, using uh, AWS private link uh, on the SaaS provider side, you by providing your service in, behind an NLB and adding support for private link. Uh, the SaaS consumer now first gets uh, the security of, okay, all that uh, transfer of data is happening in the AWS cloud itself. It's not going on private internet. Second thing, which I want to show here with the animation was around the traffic origination. The traffic originates only from the consumer side. So you don't have to worry about uh, the third party originating any traffic on into your VPC. So these are certain you know, uh, elements which are provided directly. And uh, I've seen enterprises you know, lean into it and ask for these features uh, from SaaS providers, having private connectivity. Because like a lot of these enterprises would also have their presence on AWS cloud. And even if they don't have that presence on AWS cloud, uh, they have it in that data center. Uh, we have capability to build piping like using direct connect or VPN connectivity right into uh, uh, AWS account, uh, uh, which is the SaaS consumer, that can be an AWS account and can be a hybrid connectivity into on-prem systems as well. So using that capability, you can still have private connectivity with your SaaS application deployed on AWS. So again, what, what we saw uh, was, you know, by building your SaaS application on AWS, 
uh, because there, there are these special things which you know, enterprises would ask for, private connectivity, encrypting with uh, AWS keys, or even having private, private connectivity to data on S3. Uh, it's easier to get all these features when you are building your SaaS application on AWS. We see that with uh, all the, again, with all the compliance tools and everything, because you can build faster, you reduce time to develop that MVP product of yours. We have seen that, like, you know, you, uh, enterprise, uh, some of the SaaS providers were able to reduce their time to build that MVP by 30 to 50%. Uh, then think about you want to launch in a different region, right? So you already have your service in one region, you want to launch in a different region. On new markets, because AWS is pro, provide uh, no AWS regions are provided across the globe. You are able to reduce that time to launch new markets as well. Uh, most of the service features in one region are mapped to other region. There might be some variables there, so your team would have to, of course, test the application in other region as well. The SaaS application would have to be configured and tested. There are certain minor differences in different regions, so those would have to be tested. Reduce time to scale uh, your customer usage. So the one part here is like, you know, on-prem, if you're deploying it on-prem to scale is very like not, not so easy. With AWS, uh, even if you want to scale very fast, there are ca capabilities to do that. Uh, it's not a limitless storage or compute capability. But you can work with AWS teams if you have a, a, a way, like, you know, if you're migrating a very large workload or you want to scale very high, you can work with the AWS teams and achieve that. And finally, with all these tools, your engineering teams can then deploy very fast. That's the whole area here. Uh, so that uh, that's the main value. Like if you are de developing on AWS for a lot of these enterprises who are also on AWS, you generate that value and generate that flywheel immediately. Again, for your growth and acceleration and profitability, what we see is by first year, uh, these SaaS providers saw double digit growth, right? And I said that for, if you're a SaaS provider, having that growth is the primary factor. If you're not having that growth, then those customers are probably going somewhere else. So you, we are seeing that customers who are like, you know, SaaS providers who are developing their services on AWS are seeing that growth. And other thing is the recurring revenue. Uh, because it's a different model, SaaS model is around recurring. So you, all your enterprise customers will be uh, uh, mostly, if they're happy with your service, they will be recurring customers. It will generate the recurring revenue. And by year three, you would see your operating margins will be like, you know, and on average, which we saw from our survey, our operating margins were up by 31, 41%, uh, gross margins for 70%. So they were they're like very good margins there. And by year three, 70% return on investment was met. So of course it's a, it's not an easy lift, right? So if, I, if you are a product company right now and you're moving to SaaS, that's a big investment on your part. But at the same time, by doing this faster on AWS, by developing this faster on AWS, you can expect that return on investment as well, which would be pretty fast because we are uh, trying to build a service based on automation. We're trying to build a service here, which would be growing very fast. So I know this is a very crowded slide. Uh, I want to and okay, uh, take key takeaways here on the best practices, right? So when it comes to compliance or uh, the best practices on AWS, we have uh, created certain uh, guidelines for uh, startups around uh, uh, security. There uh, is of course, well-architected tool. We did mention the well-architected tool before all, as well. So with the well-architected tool, there are different lenses as well. So if you have a SaaS specific solution, you can use a SaaS lens. And at times, I know that, you know, you, a lot of you might think that, yes, your team in your organization knows the best about your own architecture. Why do you should use AWS well-architected tool? And I would just like to comment there, like 
it's not going to probably you know at times you might al already know what uh, is brought about by well architecture you might already know the deficiencies within your organizations but uh, what it helps you is also a prioritized list so if you have like 15 things which you already knew it will give you a priority list on you know, what things should go next foundational technical review here is uh, something which we uh, work with our partners to support so there are certain elements around well architected doesn't cover the whole well architected but uh, it covers reliability security uh, so those and operational excellence those kind of capabilities are covered by a foundational technical review which we work with our partners so uh, aws works with uh, partners to uh, to onboard them in the foundational technical review uh, so that we can verify to a level that what they how they are implementing their SaaS solutions on aws with uh, you know a lot of these tools like uh, config and aws security hub cis aws benchmarks are provided so if you want to run this on your architecture uh, on your environment aws environment you can get a benchmark report on of how if your account meets this uh, uh, or not so and you can then work towards closing those gaps if you if those are identified uh, i just like to bring uh, one uh, you know story I, I one of my partners couchbase they're also present here if you have uh, seen uh, that as so right from uh, the onset when they were creating uh, the saas uh, solution they were very engaged with us uh, we see that you know that customers are facing uh, issue around okay a lot of these customers are on relational databases how to move into um, the modern databases couchbase was uh, wanted to provide that solution as a saas uh, they worked very closely with the aws went through the well architected review frameworks uh, followed some of the best practices by aws saas factory and uh, came to market with a saas solution uh, we have got feedback from some of the customers that you know they saw uh, total cost of ownership for like what workloads they were having by 50%. So having this great customer experience can actually help you get that recurring revenue as well as getting that growth for your market. So that's, that's something which I want to depict. Uh, we have, and uh, this is one uh, partner story I I'm sharing here. But we work with a lot of partners uh, and uh, help them towards you know creating uh, uh, better solutions on AWS. As a key takeaway, I know that we are like over time, so yeah, I, I just want to say that for enterprise ready SaaS, uh, think about uh, you know security and compliance is the very important. But the key element is again frictionless onboarding. So. If the frictionless onboarding is not there, you won't like, you know, you won't have that growth uh, from your customers. So that's the key element. Think about security, frictionless onboarding, and uh, you, you need to support the different uh, SaaS models. As I said, like you would have a free tier, you, you would have paid tier, you would have, you know, enterprise customers, support all the different models uh, so that uh, you're not losing out on different segments. And the whole key to being a SaaS provider and being agile is you want to get to that all the different segments. You don't have to you know, stick to one segment because then you won't get that growth. And uh, finally, we don't want you to do take all the heavy lifting. Use AWS services to uh, you know, uh, get all that uh, shared SaaS services built, right? So leverage AWS capabilities, AWS services there and focus on building the best experience from your business yeah with that uh like I'll, I'll end this uh session but i'm happy to take any questions i know we are over time right now so we can take the questions in the hall or like during the happy hour thank you